You guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, guys, I think we're about ready to get started here. <clears throat> here we go. People have been hunting for sun grazing comets for hundreds of years. But as of 1979, we only knew of less than a dozen. Today, we have seen about 2,500. Why did the number increase? Understanding this starts with the Kreutz path. In the late 1800s, Heinrich Kreutz observed that many recent comets traveling near the Sun appear to follow the same orbit. On this Kreutz path, as we've come to call it, it takes a comet about 800 years to complete one loop around the Sun. While there are other orbits of sun grazers, Kreutz comets are the most common. All of the comets in this orbit came from a single comet observed thousands of years ago. As the comet moved closer to the sun, the ice binding it together evaporated, breaking it into smaller pieces that the sun's gravity pulled apart. Every time the comet comes around the Kreutz path, this can happen again, resulting in a new generation of comets. It might sound like this would clutter the solar system full of comets, <laughs> But that is not the case. Some of the new comets are small enough that they become completely vaporized as they approach the sun. There are more comets observed, not because there are more in the solar system, but because we have better ways to see them. Spotting a sun grazer from the ground is difficult because of the blinding sunlight. Now, spacecraft designed to observe the sun make the job a lot easier. Since the joint ESA-NASA mission SOHO launched in 1995, it has shown us thousands more comets than any tool before. To date, it has found 2,387 comets. With SOHO, we can now see the smaller, fainter comets close to the sun just long enough to add them to our list of sun grazers before they vaporize. The spacecraft's data is available online, so now anyone can discover a comet. Roughly 75% of these comets have been found by amateur astronomers. Other solar observatories, such as NASA's SDO, weren't expected to provide good comet observations, but they captured some beautiful images, creating more possibilities for comet research using unexpected tools. Now that we can observe comets better than ever, who knows, maybe you will spot the next sun grazer. Everybody, this is Scott Roberts from the Explore Alliance and, and Explore Scientific. And it's been a while since we've been on the air, uh, but really happy to come back with our 110th Global Star Party here on January 10th. 
We've got a great comet up there, C2002 E3, uh, uh, which uh, it makes it kind of timely for our theme of celestial vi visitors. And there's something like at least 10 meteor showers going on this month. So, uh, you know, there's always something going on in the sky and uh, we're visited by many things uh, out there. So uh, within our solar system. Um, I wanted to, um, you know, thank everyone. I, I hope you all had a... Uh, great holiday season and uh, um, you know I want to thank you all for the messages and emails and stuff that you sent to us uh, and to me personally so that was really that was great um, and uh, we're looking forward to a whole new year of global star parties and other events that we'll be doing as well so but uh, let's um, let's get started uh, with our group uh, I had uh, uh, juggled our normal schedule around just a little bit, and so our first, our yeah, first guest that's going to be on will be um, yeah. um, will be Chuck Allen from uh, the Astronomical League. Chuck, thanks for coming on. Uh, for those of you who do not know about the Astronomical League, uh, then that means you probably haven't seen any global star parties. The Astronomical League is uh, the world's largest federation of astronomy clubs uh, with over 20,000 members growing more and more each day. And uh, they have amazing um, uh, observing programs, amazing uh, award ceremonies, and they have a fantastic event called Alcon that's held each year. This time it's gonna be held in Louisiana. Charles will talk about that more, but, uh, um, uh, or Chuck as we, uh, as his friends call him, but uh, Chuck, thanks for coming on to Global Star Party. Well, thank you, Scott. And uh, that plaque on the back wall that you see there is the Astronomical League's highest honor, and it couldn't go to a more deserving person who has supported our youth award programs for, I think, close to 30 years. And Scott, uh, we're, we're deeply indebted to you for that. And I'll get started with the questions for tonight. And if I may share a screen here. <clears throat> and okay. Uh, first of all, let me, can you see that okay? So, yes. Okay. Uh, this is what I've been doing for the last uh, three and a half months, uh, all driving, about 18,000 miles of it. It started with this trip to our convention in Albuquerque, which was really very exciting. And I didn't get sick once coming back from these trips. Uh, I got sick three times. And I'm that way tonight, and I apologize if I uh, seem congested. That's because I am. Um, at the convention, we had the opportunity to meet Harrison Schmidt, of course, the geologist who walked on the moon on Apollo 17. Um, we, uh, I took uh, Scott Harrington and two of his brothers. Uh, Scott writes for s and as you know. Uh, we may know, and uh, we took a little Western tour. I spent uh, about three weeks up in South Dakota helping a young friend who uh, paramotored into 72,000 volt lines and lost both hands. <clears throat> a very uh, difficult situation, uh, which he's overcoming beautifully. Uh, I had a book tour to do with uh, the person I wrote a biography about, uh, a surfer from South Africa who was bitten by two great whites or attacked by two great whites um, out in San Diego. So um, uh, lots of hotels, lots of kids, lots of uh, restaurants, and a cold or RSV or something three times. Uh, I think it's from being cooped up for too long due to COVID, you lose some of your immunity. Anyway, before we get to the questions tonight, uh, we always like to give a solar warning to people starting out in astronomy, those of you who are beginners or who are buying a telescope for the first time or even binoculars to use for astronomical purposes, there's some things you need to know about observing the sun. It can be done safely, but it can also be a horrendous experience that can result in permanent blindness if you do it incorrectly. Uh, you never want to observe the sun without professionally made solar filters and include energy rejection filters that are securely mounted at the front end of the telescope or the binoculars. And I mean securely, and I mean the front end, not the eyepiece end. Uh, never use a solar filter or welder's glass that attaches to the eyepiece. They can overheat and crack. 
don't leave a telescope or binoculars unattended at an astronomy event, especially in daytime, lest kids may attempt to acquire the sun with it. And I've seen that almost happen. Um, eclipse glasses are meant for use with just your eyes. Do not use them with a telescope or binoculars. I think Scott uh, once did a little experiment to show people what happens if you put well, just gla excuse me, eclipse glasses in front of an eyepiece and aim it at the sun. They melt very quickly. Um, and uh, other little warnings here. Uh, if you need help learning how to do it safely, you have astronomy clubs nearby who are experienced in this, and please take advantage of that. I'd like uh, first to start with the answers from December 13th. These were rather humorous Christmas questions. Uh, one was, uh, I think, oriented toward what is, which is the correct scene for Christmas of 2022. And it was that the moon was not full, but a waning crescent instead. Actually, I think it was a one day old waxing crescent, but close enough. Uh, the second question uh, had to do with what really good eyepiece you would choose of these three if uh, you wanted the best possible choice. Um, and the most likely focal length and the best eyepiece would be a 25 millimeter nitrogen PERS waterproof fully coated eyepiece. I think the mm -hmm. obvious answer was just in the adjectives there. And finally, there was a quote from William Herschel. It was the giveaway to which Astronomical League program was Santa working on. That was either the Herschel 400 or possibly the Herschel 2. Each of those programs involves observing 400 objects, most of which are galaxies. Uh, the correct answers that were added to the door prize list for December were Andrew Corkle, John Nabb, and Adrian Bradley. And the winners for December were Adrian Bradley, Bradley, Josh Kovach, and John Williams. And now the questions for tonight. Um, again, send your answers to by email to secretary at astroleague.org. Uh, that's Terry Mann, but the email address is secretary at astroleague.org. First of all, Halley's Comet was famously captured in this 230 foot long cloth artwork produced shortly after the Battle of Hastings in 1066. In what city can you go to see it? See the tapestry, not how it's come. Okay, question number two. Oops. What person uh, who did not own a telescope co-discovered this comet while observing M70 through a friend's telescope in 1995? Okay, and comet C 2014 UN 271 is famous for what cometary record? Is it the largest nucleus, the longest orbital period, the speed at sun passage, or the longest observed gas tail? Hmm. That's a tough one. Again, send your answers to secretary at astroleague.org. And uh, sorry, I had the answer slide there. The uh, Astronomical League Live event will return on Friday, January 27th uh, at 7 p.m. EST, and we invite you to join us then. We'll have speakers. Um, these are also hosted, of course, by Scott Roberts, for which we're greatly indebted, and uh, hope to see you on Friday, January 27th. And that's it for tonight, Scott. Great. Okay. Okay. Um, that's wonderful. I, I hear, you know, one of the people that we have... Uh, on our program tonight is Ed Seaman, and he's going to talk a little bit about uh, Northeast Astronomy Forum. I hear a rumor that the league might be there. Yes, uh, uh, Carol Orge, president of the league, uh, I will be there. Terry Mann will be there. We'll be uh, sponsoring a booth there. Oh, that's great. So that's April, the weekend of April 15th and 16th. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So we've got. Uh, you know, we have a, 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 an unusual lineup this time in that we have uh, um, uh, people from uh, the telescope retail industry that's going to be here with us. So we'll get to hear their uh, perspective on astronomy outreach as being a retailer. You know, that's kind of my background. That's how I get started. Uh, but uh, it doesn't matter which door you go through. Uh, you know, it's a it's an amazing journey once you start and for me I, I just never ever get tired of it so um, so anyhow but thanks again uh, Chuck and we will uh, we'll see you guys uh, next week sounds great
Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, so our next speaker, uh, who's normally first on base, is uh, David Levy. David is at uh, a good friend's house at this point, and uh, so we're going to add him in. David, uh, you were on mute. Let me, uh, there we go. So there we are. Hello there, Scotty. Hi, everybody. Howdy. Great. So, David, um, uh, you are our, our theme this, this month or not this month, but this week, was celestial visitors. And any time I think of celestial visitors, I think of comets. And any time I think about comets, I think about David Levy. So, uh, David, I'm going to let you take it away, but thanks for coming on. Well, thank you, Scott, and it's good to be here. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about comets. Um, I just got interested in comets a few minutes ago. <laughs> Uh, or a few weeks ago, or a few months ago, or a few couple of months ago, and you discovered how many comets? <laughs> uh, I like comets, and um, I uh, remember when I was in the sixth grade in 19 March of 1960, our teacher wanted us to give a lecture, to give speeches, and so I thought, well, what am I going to talk about? And back then, in March 1960, it was before I really had an interest in astronomy, decided to, talk, to give a lecture about comets. And I was very nervous because I didn't really know if the kids would laugh at me. Anyway, so I was so nervous, I had a uh, piece of blank paper that I would look at, give in my lecture, and uh, so that if anybody wanted to ask any questions about comets, and I didn't know the answer to, I could look at this piece of blank paper and say something. So that day, I talked about comets in the night sky. I talked about uh, the first major comet, which was Halley's Comet. And uh, I said that Halley's Comet will next become a great comet and visible in 1986, which is so far off in the future, we don't have to worry about it. Hmm. I even said that, that on that day that if you looked hard enough, you could actually discover a comet, and it would be very interesting. And uh, anyway, so I finished the lecture, and the teacher looked at me and said, well, good speech, Levy. Can I take a look at your notes? And I just had this blank sheet of paper, and the kids knew that it was a blank sheet of paper because I told them. So they told the teacher, teacher, I have them a blank sheet of paper in case I blow the lecture. And so the teacher started laughing, and I started laughing, and the other kids started to laugh. Anyway, that summer, I became interested in astronomy, seriously interested. The um, idea of um, discovering a comet was not something that really appealed to me yet. That didn't happen until I was going to my, I was going to my uh, lecture uh, French oral examination. I was and went living in Montreal at the time, and you had to be, you had to know, have a speaking knowledge of French in order to graduate from college. Mm. And uh, anyway, I remember walking to school to the Laura oral examination, and uh, hello, we have a. A comet dog here tonight. Comet dog. Was, the comet dog <laughs> was going to do a lecture. And uh, this is the official comet dog of the David Rossiter household. <laughs> anyway, so going back to uh, my lecture, I was I was going to uh, I was going to the um, to the French oral examination. I got to school, I went to the boardroom and sat, and there was a long table. And one of the, the table was Mr. Hutchison, who was going to do the oral exam. At the other end of the table was me. And uh, Mr. Hutchison asked me some questions, which I answered. And then he said, the answer question that I expected, what do you want to do as a career? And I looked up at him, and I was very proud of myself because I had this all prepared. I sat down and I opened my mouth and I said, Monsieur Assisson, je veux découvrir 
on Comet. Mr. Hutchison, I would like to discover a comet. And he looked at me and he looked at the others and he, he said, how the hell do you expect to make any money doing something like that? <laughs> and I, I laughed and he laughed very hard. And uh, the others in the room laughed and he said, okay, Mr. Levy, I'm going to give you credit for your uh, choice of careers, if only because that is the craziest, most original idea for a career I have ever heard in all the years I've done the fringe orals here. But I'm going to warn you, you'd better find a comet before 20 years, because if you don't find a comet within 20 years, I'm going to um, come back and I'm going to lower your mark. Oh. And uh, anyway, so I that fall on the 17th of December, 1965, I decided to start my search for comets. I was walking the dog and not the comet dog. It was our beagle that we had named Clipper. And uh, I know that um, the speaker before me had just announced that there would be a meeting of the Astronomical League in Louisiana this summer. And uh, I intend to be there. And I will bring my latest book, which is a book about a magic beagle named Clipper who takes a group of children on a tour through the cosmos. The book is called Clipper, The Cosmos and Children, Finding the Eureka Moment. And I don't have a copy of it with me right now, but next week I promise I will have one to show you. You can get the book right this minute on Amazon. It is available on Amazon. The way to do it is to go to Amazon, go to books, and then type in Clipper Cosmos, and that book should come up. And you can get it right this minute on Amazon.com. And I'd be happy to autograph it next time I see you. Anyway, I'm going to do the quote. I'm going to do the quote uh, right now, the quote of the week. The quote of the week will be, from Hopkins's, George Manley Hopkins's poem that he wrote. He was a very difficult poem to poet to read. I mean, he was, his rhyme scheming was, you know, strong rhythm was very difficult to follow. And he, as a poet, he was very hard to read. But he did write a poem when he was an undergraduate at college, at Balliol College at Oxford. And uh, the poem, that he wrote was, I am like a slip of comet. And that's what I'm going to read to you. I am like a slip of comet, scarce worth discovery. In some corners seeing bridging the slender difference of two stars. But when she sights the sun, she grows and sizes and spins her skirts out while her central star shakes his cocooning mists. And so she comes to fields of light Millions of traveling rays pierce her. She hangs upon the plain cased sun and sucks the light as full as Gideon's fleece. But then her tether calls her. She falls off, and as she dwindles, sheds a smock of gold amidst the sistering planets and then goes out into the cavernous dark. So I go out, my little sweet is done. I have drawn heat from this contagious sun to not ungentle death now forth I run. And so on that note, I'm going to wish you all the best on uh, this lovely evening in comments. I will be back next week. And now back to you, Scott Roberts. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Uh, is it clear where you are tonight? Will you be doing some yes, observing? It, it is clear, but there are clouds coming in. It's supposed to be a mainly clear night, mm -hmm. but like we're going to have some clouds for the first part of the night. And, uh, uh, it, but at the moment it's sort of partly cloudy and partly clear. Well, okay, I know you'll be out there. That's great. Well, thanks again. Our next speaker uh, is a senior associate editor of Astronomy Magazine, uh, Allison Klesman. Uh, Allison has been on Global Star Party once before, I think only once before, if I'm correct with that. And, yeah. um, is that right? Yeah, so, I think it was just uh, once. 
Just once. Okay. Well, it's great. Uh, we had a little conversation uh, uh, before we, uh, uh, you know, got everything arranged here. But I'm really happy to have Allison on uh, to talk about, uh, you know, what goes on inside Astronomy Magazine. And uh, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Allison. But thank you for honoring our 110th Global Star Party. Of course. Thanks for having me. Um, I have a few slides. I don't really know that I need them. They're mostly just my talking points. So I don't know if you guys would rather stare at my face or my slides, but <laughs> um, I guess I'll just start. Fine. All right. Well, we'll go with this. Um, if I look off to the side, it's because my notes are over here. <laughs> no problem. Um, but yeah, so I'm actually, I just recently got promoted to senior editors. Now I am one of two oh. uh, senior editors that we have okay. um, at Astronomy. I have to um, change the poster. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so. that's okay. Right. <laughs> I didn't even, didn't even notice. Um, yeah, so I've been with the magazine uh, six years, pretty much. I think I six years out of December, so just about exactly six years now. Um, but I and I kind of wanted to talk about um, both my background a little bit, so kind of where where I where I'm coming from, and then also uh, what we do in the magazine, kind of what what I do as an editor, um, and then I'll give you a tiny tiny sneak peek um, at maybe some issues coming up. I can't say too much, but a little bit. Um, so my background actually is in science, not in writing. Uh, so I have a PhD in astronomy. So I was originally going the science track. So I started out as an undergraduate working on physics and planetary science. Um, I did several different projects. Um, I actually mostly started out as a planetary scientist. So even though my undergraduate degree is in physics, I kind of switch to physics because it sounded more impressive um, or at least more broad, <laughs> um, but I was really doing planetary science, um, which is interesting because when I started out, I I wanted to be an astronomer and planetary science wasn't a word I knew. Um, it was kind of a, a, a thing I had to learn was part of astronomy. And I feel like they're still almost sometimes treated a little bit separately, um, but they're really, they're really essentially the same thing. Um, one's a little, clearly a little more specialized, but um, just because you're a planetary scientist doesn't mean you're not a real astronomer, I guess. Um, oh, so I worked, <laughs> right. you know, so I originally thought I was like, oh, it's not astronomy. That's not a real <laughs> astronomer. Come on. <laughs> But uh, but no, no, I fell in love with planetary, so it's planetary science, really. Um, I, I've done a couple of different projects. Um, I worked on uh, make, make, making maps of Ganymede's surface, uh, the oxygen on Ganymede's surface, specifically uh, with Hubble data um, in the early 2000s. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and also in the early 2000s, there were several um, Pluto occultations. Pluto went in front of several different stars. Um, and so I was on a team that worked to, uh, I, I went out every single night and imaged the stars that it was going to occult, uh, and then came back every single day in the lab and did, did astronomy, astrometry to get very precise positions of those stars so we could tell where the shadows were gonna fall and where you wanted to you know, drive your truck or your boat with your telescope on it or fly your plane if you're lucky enough. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also worked on um, what I kind of call comet asteroid differentiation or comet colors. Uh, so I looked at essentially the spectroscopic colors of several different comets and several dis different asteroids to kind of better understand, you know, if you've got something sitting in the asteroid belt, for example, uh, is it an asteroid because it's an asteroid and it has no ice on it? Or is it an asteroid because it's sitting in the belt? And if you, you know, smushed it closer to the sun, would it develop a tail? Is it really kind of like this hidden comet? So can you tell, you know, Know, that kind of information by looking at colors or surface features or surface information. Um, I went on to do a master's in what's called geosystems, which is really just kind of a marriage of geology and planetary science. Um, and I worked on um, light curves and rotational information on asteroid Kutasi. Uh, so again, went out every single night, took images of the asteroid, came back during the day and, and looked at light curves all day. Um, and then eventually when I went on to my PhD uh, at University of Florida, no one, there, there were like two professors doing planetary science and they didn't need any students. Uh, so then I had to do real astronomy. <laughs> uh, so I, I skipped over uh, everything in between planets and went right to supermassive black holes and galaxies. Uh, and so that was my PhD thesis was working on kind of doing a giant survey of uh, active supermassive black holes. So kind of eating actively feeding supermassive black holes hmm. in, in galaxies. So don't ask me much about stars because I know next to nothing about stars, but I can do planets and I can do galaxies and black holes. <laughs> That's enough. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we need stars. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And then after that, by that point, I kind of had discovered that 
a lot of the work that I have been doing, um, I don't want to turn anybody off of astronomy. Maybe this is what you love, but a lot of it was coding. A lot of it was kind of sitting behind a computer and mm -hmm. making, you know, making the computer give you all the information you needed from these, you know, beautiful images. Um, but I really liked the beautiful images and I really liked writing. So I liked writing my thesis, like actually writing it was the most fun part, you know, of the thesis for me. Um, so I was like, maybe I, maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe I should do something else. Um, so I wanted to get into science writing. Um, so I worked as, as a writer, I started out just as a web writer, I actually didn't do science writing, I just worked, you know, as a writer kind of doing all sorts of articles, but that really taught me how to do, how to write short articles. Um, if you read anything I write in the magazine, I'm really bad at writing short stuff. <laughs> uh, mm. Clearly, every word I've written is very important, I can't cut any of it. Um, so that's always my, my biggest challenge, is writing something short. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm working on that still, but that was kind of where I at least learned to start doing that. Um, so as you know, after I worked as a web writer for several years, um, I, I kind of lucked into this job, honestly, at astronomy. Um, and I've been there, like I said, for six years. Um, and I, to, I would say they, they lucked into getting it. So <laughs> I, I'd like to think that too. Um, so just to give you a peek behind the scenes, you know, what does an editor at astronomy do, for example? Um, well, we edit, that is, that is step one, is we definitely edit. Um, but before you can edit, you need, you need a story to edit. So we will work together um, to either, you know, look at pitches that we've gotten or develop stories that we want to tell, um, either ourselves or, or commission someone else to do. But um, at least the kind of the luxury that I think we have is we get to take, you know, something that's interesting to us and say, I want to write about this. I want to, you know, do a story on, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, one of my favorite stories that I recently did co comes back to planetary science um, and it's looking as, at Earth as a planet um, because I feel like Earth often gets ignored when you think about planetary science and you think about the solar system. But we know so much about Earth. Um, and so, you know, looking at it kind of as how do we study it as a planet, as a whole, and how can we compare it to, you know, the rest of the solar system. Uh, mm -hmm. So I got to do that kind of fun story, which was, was again, a lot of fun to kind of dive back into that field after some time. So we develop stories, we write stories, we do edit stories, but there's a lot more to it as well. Um, not only do we have to edit the stories and work with the authors or you know, work on it ourselves, we have to, you know, sit down and say, okay, what, what images do I want to show with this story? Um, so we're largely responsible, not always, sometimes the authors, you know, will send in images, but we have to pick what pictures you're going to see that go with the story. Um, and then we hand everything over to our art director and she says, well, you can only fit, you know, five of these 20 pictures that you've chosen. So which ones are most important, uh, which is always hard. Um, the limitation of print is space and we always run into that. Uh, so we do that. And then a lot of our images are um, made in house. So a lot of the diagrams that you'll see, um, we have an illustrator oh, wow. who works with us and we'll kind of, you know, I'll show her my little like stick figure drawing and she'll turn it into something beautiful. Um, but so, you know, we'll actually work with someone to develop those images or we can find something maybe that NASA has done and say, this is a good idea. Can we kind of, you know, adapt this for our own so we can tell, you know, the story showing, showing this image or, you know, if there's a process or a chart or something we want to show, we want to make that you know, accessible to everybody. Um, we don't want it to look boring. We want it to look, you know, interesting and engaging. So she she helps us with that quite a bit. Um, and then the last part is kind of making everything fit. Like I mentioned, you know, you have to pick how many pictures you can have. Um, and then you have to kind of put it all together. Our, you know, our art director, you know, plays the Tetris puzzle of putting it together on the page. But then if there's text running over, we have to decide what goes, what stays, or or add something if it needs adding or ask the author for more. So that's kind of the story side of it. Um, specifically, I tend to, um, I work on right now, I'm working on Ask Astro. So if you read the Ask Astro section, I, I get to pick the questions that go in there, the ones that seem to be the most popular, the ones that people you know really are wondering about. Um, it's interesting because a lot of times we'll get similar questions from several different people. And that kind of says, okay, a lot of people are wondering about this. We wanna ask this question. Um, I also work on the top 10. I write the top 10 every year. I've done that for, I think the past three years now. Um, which is actually very challenging because we have to write the top 10 stories of the previous year while we're still in the previous year. Um, so for example, I was writing the top 10 <laughs> stories in 2022 in October. Wow. Okay. So, so if you read uh, the February issue, which I believe is out now, so I'm not giving too much away here. Um, Artemis doesn't feature as prominently as I would like it to in the top 10. And that's because they kept pushing the launch back and I didn't know if it was going to launch or not. And I think it literally launched the day before we had to send it to the printer. 
Uh, so I was like, all right, let me tweak something and throw it in here. But you know, we couldn't you know feature it as heavily. So it will it will appear in 2023. There's an extra sneak peek for you. But um, so so that's a challenge too. Um, and I also work on the sky this month. Um, this the kind of the middle of the book we call it. So you know the star charts that appear in the middle of the book. Um, I edit that column. I'm not writing it, but I'm editing it. And then I pick kind of what events seem to be worth showing. Um, and I work on the star charts. We have a, a star mapping program, and then I'll kind of take those images and give them again to our illustrator, who will make them pretty and make them you know all match our style and make it all very accessible. Um, so we do that. Um, and then we also work on web. So, you know, we're working on basically the magazine and the website at the same time. And it's kind of the same thing. We get to pick stories that we think are interesting. You know, obviously there are new stories that we want to feature um, that we kind of have to, whether they interest or not, but it's astronomy, it's all interesting. So it's never, never really that hard. Um, right. But I have to admit, the, the favorite story I've done for web was, again, out of left field. It was something I came up with um, after watching um, a YouTube channel that I enjoy. But I wanted to know how humans would decompose on Mars, for example. OK. Um, you, know, <laughs> you know how people, you know, decompose on Earth, but it's it's it has a lot to do with the biosphere. It's a lot of, you know, carrion sort of insects and birds and things coming sure. in and, and handling that for us. Um, there's that doesn't exist on Mars. Uh, so what would happen? So I got to call up a bunch of, you know, forensic anthropologists and ask them questions about how bodies decompose in very cold oxygen poor conditions. Um, so that was kind of fun because it's not not something I would think that you would just be like freeze dried or something. It's basically that's what would happen is you would actually essentially become kind of this desiccated mummy. So if you want to know what happens on Mars, that's that's the exciting thing that happens on Mars. <laughs> Wow. Okay. It's a problem because bodies don't go away on Mars. Um, you know, if you right. bury a body in the ground on Earth after a long enough time, it's going to go away. That that isn't going to happen on Mars. So maybe mm -hmm. that's something we need to consider at some point. Sure. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's that's kind of what we do. So we're doing simultaneously a lot of different things. I also write um, the Sky This Week column for uh, for the website as well. So I simultaneously know what's going on in the next week and then five months from now, but probably not what's happening in the sky today because I've already forgotten. Wow. Uh, so I'm just little... gonna call you and find <laughs> out what's happening in the sky from now on. So. Yeah, there we go. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's. but again, I, I kind of am like, okay, well, I'm working on May right now, but I also have to work on January you know, 20th right now. So it's it's hard to figure out what's, what day mm -hmm. it is. And I never know, but I know what's coming up at least. So, so that's what's exciting. How how does Comet E3, since this is about celestial visitors yes. and, and you're you're in the know, uh, how does Comet E3 loom as far as uh, uh, excitement by you know the community and also um, are you getting better data than you would say the general public's getting? A little bit of both. I mean, so it is very interesting. I think a lot of people are interested in it. We actually just published an article today because we were like, oh, everybody's really excited about this. We should, you know, it, it appeared in our sky this month. I threw it in sky this week, but then, you know, people want to look specifically for E3. Um, mm -hmm. We did want to have an article on that. So yes, I think it's getting very popular because, you know, as we all hope it will become naked eye. Um, it's looking good. You know, we never know what's going to happen, but um, if it, and I think if it becomes even remotely naked eye, then yeah, it will, it will be very big. So people are really <laughs> hoping that will happen. Um, as for data, you know, maybe not necessarily. I mean, sometimes we do. Sometimes we'll, we can kind of get that inside information. Um, for this one in particular, no. Um, I think it's more just a matter of knowing where to look, say how to use, you know, the JPL Horizons ephemeris system, for example, which I'm very familiar with, but a lot of people may not be. Um, mm -hmm. There are tools online or like the minor the Minor Planet Center, the Comet Observers, uh, it's Comet Observer Database, I think is what it's called. I cannot remember off the top of my head. Right. Um, but there's there's several different resources and it's just- the CBAT, you know, maybe. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. just no- there, there's, uh, there's also another excellent website that's out there. Uh, I think it's uh, um, Yoshida. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Right. You know which yeah. one I'm talking about? Yeah. Japanese uh, comment. Aerith.net is the what is the address. <laughs> that's how yeah, I'm yeah, doing. yeah. But an amazing website that's been out yes. there for a long time. Uh, I've been looking at the, for instance, the curve, the plotted and predicted mm -hmm. curve, and it looks like the actual observations are matching the curve pretty well, which if it does, it's going to hit like fifth magnitude. Yeah. So that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, well, it's matching very well. Yeah, no, his website is yeah an excellent resource, and I'd never heard of it before I started working at astronomy. So again, it's kind of just just knowing the resources maybe more than than, sure. than insider information. Um, 
And then the last thing I wanted to talk about real quick um, is that uh, this August is our 50th anniversary. So it will be our 50th anniversary issue in August. So we're going to get some some extra pages. It'll be a nice long issue. Um, we've got some really good stories, um, including a letter from David Walther, who is the uh, brother of our founder, Steve Walther, um, mm. who unfortunately passed away very shortly after the magazine kind of, you know, came into existence. But his brother has been very active. Um, I believe he financed it for quite some time and, you know, was responsible mm. for it, you know, getting off the ground in the first place. So getting him to kind of contribute was really, really cool. Um, so we've got we've got a special issue. We also have out the January issue is a special issue on comets as well. David Levy wrote wrote an introduction for us, um, so that's also a really cool issue to check out. It's it's Absolutely. all comets, so it's Absolutely. it's really cool. That's great. That's great. Yeah. It should be an all comets all the time channel. Yes. You know, exactly. So, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there could be there could be because there's comets there's up not, all the yeah. time. You know. So that's right. Yes. Well, Allison, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, if um, if you are not a subscriber to Astronomy Magazine, it's easy enough. Just go to astronomy.com and sign up. You can get digital copies or print or both, you know. And um, it's great to have uh, senior editors like Allison come on to the program. So thanks very much, Allison. Yeah, of course. Great. Okay, so we are going to... Uh, we're going to move to talk to a couple of different um, um, people that are actually involved in the industry of retailing telescopes. And this is my background. I, I, I got involved in uh, selling cameras first. I love optics, of course. Uh, um, but uh, I was introduced to kind of more serious hobby lifestyle level uh, telescopes about 1980 and uh, that was uh, enough time for me to get really into uh, Halley's Comet at that time and get into starting an astronomy club and all of that stuff and it's just been from that day forward has just been this amazing journey for me uh, the people that I've been able to meet and the, the things that I've seen in the sky and you know, it just never, <laughs> I never think it's going to get stale or old. It can't, okay, because, it, you know, we live in this changing living universe, you know, and uh, if, you're, if you're awake to that, uh, you know, it, it changes you. And um, so uh, the person we're going to uh, right now is Mac Mackenzie Hughes uh, at Fort Worth Camera. Uh, I want to, <clears throat> I want to talk about this a little bit because... Uh, Texas used to have many uh, telescope retailers, and now uh, there are just a few, a couple maybe, uh, that actually where you can walk in and you can see telescopes on the showroom floor. And, um, you know, there's a lot of places that, uh, especially during the heyday of Halley's Comet, for example, a lot of people that had camera shops or different kinds of shops they put telescopes in there just to see if they would sell, okay? But getting involved with the astronomical community is a different, uh, is a different deal, you know? And that's, uh, that's something that uh, McKenzie uh, and his team are about to do and have already done uh, with our team. And so, McKenzie, thanks for coming on to the program. Can you tell us a little bit uh, about your role at Fort Worth Camera and uh, maybe a little bit about the camera shop itself and um, and then what you guys are going to be doing uh, with your outreach program. Uh, outreach program sounds way too official for what we're trying to accomplish, but I will say that uh, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you. I, fe I feel very out of my element speaking in the company of such experts and um, I, I claim to have, you know, well, Okay, Just, so I, I was I was exactly I was exactly where you're at right now. Okay, when I started, you know. Well, I was, okay, I was surrounded by people. You still that, have uh, you know on me. observatory uh, directors, and we had JPL scientists coming in and very expert amateur astronomers. And what I had was passion. I, I just loved the idea of people looking up, you know, and I loved optics. So that that's yeah. kind of where I started with all this, and I knew quite a bit about photography. So. That was my door to coming into all of this stuff. For me, it seemed way too obvious to uh, that a camera store that already sells optics should be selling 
another type of optic as well, telescopes. And um, I don't know what it was, but I, I have something I tell people. It's like adult onset space fascination. I don't mm-hmm. know what it is, but I've only I've I've gotten more interested as I've gotten just a little bit older. And as such, I wanted to start looking up. And uh, in our case, we could not actually access a dealership for you know the traditional outlets of mead or whatever the the, the names that Joe consumer knew about. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I started looking a little closer and it turns out there was a great outlet for distribution just really kind of down the road in Arkansas. And we made friends with a good group of guys at Explore Scientific Thank and um, Tyler Bowman and Kent Martz and Scott uh, have helped us grow, grow access for consumers to just um, mm-hmm. have another hobby. And in this case, it dovetails well because we can put cameras on these things. And guess what? We sell cameras. So... Um, if it's okay, I, I don't know quite how to share my screen, but I have a, a there's, video. There's a up. green button at the bottom of your Zoom. Uh, yes, it is. Share screen. Found it. Here you uh, go. Am I you sharing screen? Find, not yet. You need to find the little square that's got your, if you have a PowerPoint or pictures. I don't. I, just have a, I guess I can't share my desktop. Uh, you can. Um, you can. Hmm. Share. Well, it's going to make me open system preferences and all this stuff. So let's see if this actually works. But yeah, if you have an, uh, a Mac, it's going to make you do that. Ah, oh, quit and reopen. Let's do that later, maybe. Okay. Um, is this working, by the way? We see you. Oh, that's nice. Well, um, we can have you on again. I mean, uh, uh, to share, but let's kind of talk through it a yeah, little. Yeah, I can. I can absolutely continue to talk about this. It's, sure, sure. Um, there's a lot to cover. Now, you guys, as, as far as I know, uh, Mackenzie, you guys started just last year. Okay? Yeah, I was going to just mention that we haven't been doing this for even a year. Uh, right. I think uh, April or early May was the first time we actually saw a product in our store. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew I knew very very little, and the first thing I did was even before we got the gear was sat my entire staff down and started watching videos from Explore Scientific's website. It was Tyler Bowman, and we w- learned the terms of the different mounts and eyepieces and the types of scopes. So that was step one. Step two is to get a very small order and start exposing our public to it. Right. And it worked and, but that wasn't enough. So we just started to put together events based on astronomy slash astrophotography, Mm -hmm. which is something that is kind of what we do. We do a lot of events. That's awesome. So you do it in photography too, right? We combine the two. We -hmm. talk about, I mean, how to take pictures of the, you know, star trails or, or whatever. It's, it's pretty basic for what we're all talking about today. It's, it's pretty um, pedestrian, uh, if that's the right word. Yeah, but all right. It's um, it's exciting for us though, because we're just starting and we're dealing with a with a, a customer base which is which is also just starting. Right. Um. So we've done a couple of events. Um, Tyler's come down, put together a class, and then one class in particular with the video I was going to show. Um we did a two-part thing we had an we have luckily we have a classroom in our store okay. uh, that holds about 30 people it's great and he did kind of a little uh primer of what we would see the following night and we went out to i live kind of out in sort of the country just west of fort worth and it gets pr- pretty dark mm-hmm. and uh we were busing people to this un- undisclosed location and very very beautiful and we people got a charge out of looking at just what you'd expect from a awesome. of night sky yeah it was great and um you know we moved some units from it i don't think that was really the point as, as a, some sort of right right it, 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 it sounds like a replay of what happened with me 
when I'm working in a camera shop in Oceanside, California. And it was, it was called Oceanside Photographic Center. We eventually changed the name because the, the prominence of telescopes in the store became really huge. We still sold cameras, but by the time, from 1980 to 1985, I had maybe two or three telescopes on the floor. This grew to be, in a very small camera shop, 100 telescopes on the floor. Yeah, I literally had to scoot around the telescopes to get up to the counter to pay for something. So, um, uh, but it was so much fun and it was so, gosh, it was so gratifying to see people see the moon or see, see Saturn for the first time in their lives, you know? And I realized how simple it was, you know, to, to introduce people to the sky. Yeah, no, what we're, we're finding, well, because I was in the same boat, well, we found out that there, there just wasn't a lot of places to find telescopes. There were no stores to go see one. Right. And if they were, there they might be a a sporting goods store and they were always in a box. And I don't I don't like that. Um we wanted a, a showroom of sorts. We certainly don't have one hundred scopes, but we have <laughs> right. six, we have six or eight. And it's I think it's pretty it's impressive. Good. And it's right in front when you walk in because it's the most unique thing we sell. And um yeah, I got tired of people people were calling. What, what you know, just you sell telescopes, no, but try try something online, maybe try, try right? somewhere else. And um, I didn't want to do that. And furthermore, you know, we as a camera store, we, we belong to a lot of different membership groups and organizations that are just like us, just like us, mm -hmm. and uh, sell anything that resembling um, astronomy gear. Mm -hmm. So it makes us look unique. It helps us to it um, make you unique. That's for sure. What's that? I said it, it does make you unique. Yeah, it, it it does, and it makes us look a little more educated. Although we're we're still getting there, it, it definitely makes us look. <laughs> that a comes with bit, time, you know. For yeah, sure. it makes right. us look that we just uh, we we care about doing more things, and and as a result, as a result, we are having more. Uh, events and, and one in particular, which um, I don't know the reach of this uh, this meeting or, or YouTube um, presentation, but please come down. Please visit us in Fort Worth. Um, we've got some eclipses coming up right in our path of uh, Texas. Well, that's right. Yeah, you're going to have a worldwide audience coming down. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, one in particular in 2024, we're doing a pretty big event with another store actually out in California. They're coming to us and we're going to host them. But in the meantime, May, and actually it's May, oof, May 19th, um, we have a really fantastic Museum of Science and History, the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History, right? Uh, as it turns out. And um, they, have, they have a planetarium there. So okay. that is where our, the Fort Worth Photo Fest, Yay. Okay. Yeah. Plug. Um, it's a collection of like 40 events and this is our 10th annual and uh, they're all across the city of Fort Worth and we try to team up with some cool institutions. And so this uh, museum, fantastic place. They have a planetarium, you know, state of the art. We will be doing our astronomy presentation there. That's sponsored. What a wonderful art. stage. Yeah, right. sponsored in part by Explorer Scientific, and um, Tyler Bowman will be presenting there, and um, and then there's the presentation of the, their own planetarium show. Sure. So, um, very wow, exciting. how lucky to have something like that in your own backyard, and uh, smart that you guys are taking advantage of it. Um, you know, I know that um, uh, many people will turn on to the sky. You know, because you're going to meet a lot of people that doesn't, as Allison was talking about earlier, she was talking about, you know, Earth is a planet. A lot of us, a lot of humans don't think that they're flying at unbelievable speeds through space on this planet. You know, they just think, oh, okay, I wake up in the morning, this light outside that's called the sun, all right, it's up, uh, you know, and, and then they think about their job and whatever problems that they have all day long, you know, so... Uh, yeah. You know, waking up to the fact that, um, you know, we are flying through space at unbelievable speeds 
and just and actually connected to the universe is something that you know this gateway called astronomy does and so I, I'm I'm really happy that you're that you're a part of that. How do people find out more about this event? Uh, they go to your website or of or course, um, yeah, yeah, naturally FortWorthCamera.com. You can also visit FortWorthPhotoFest.com. That event is live right now for May Fort Worth, just like it is. F O. Okay, spelled like that. Yep. Um, yeah, and, and to, to follow up on something you mentioned earlier, I was actually not aware that we are one of the few, if not only, astronomy uh, telescope retailers where you can actually see stuff in person in Texas. I don't think that's right. Uh, that's not okay for... We don't think it's right either, but... Yeah, I'll, I'll spread the word. Um, but, but it's unusual in, in a dot-com yeah. age, you know, to be and, able and to go and see something like that. I, I feel what's good for the goose is good for the gander and the more we can kind of connect and the more we can share with one another the the more knowledge grows and the more enthusiasm grows and that's for me the name of the game that's awesome that was awesome well i'm i'm glad that you uh uh you know uh you know came on to the program uh to talk with us and to yeah, let us know having me what's going on, you know, we're going to, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're going to follow up with Fort Worth camera and kind of see what that journey's like, because I know it's going to be amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, at any time, uh, Mackenzie, you want to brainstorm about, about ideas on, you know, how to grow that and to affect more people in the community, because I think there's a few people that live in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Um, they could really benefit from this. <laughs> and people will be driving from all over, all over the country to come to Dallas during the 2024 total eclipse of the sun. Uh, you're gonna experience something that is more grand than, than the uh, Halley's Comet era that I experienced at uh, what became Ocean wow. Photo and Telescope, or OPT. So. Um, I have one, one, one final question, because apparently sure. Randy is gonna be taking over. Randy, are you, a retailer as well because you're in front of a lot of telescopes perhaps yes, I, uh, is that a real place behind you that's a real place behind me yes it is i am a brick and mortar store and when i you can hear me fine can't you yeah yeah we I can. Sure can when when i retired from work my lovely wife let me open this shop and it has grown for the last six years Wow. And you can just see part of what's behind me. Where are and you? I am brick and mortar. I do not ship. Maybe some little things if people can talk me into it, but they come to me. I am in rural Illinois, middle of Illinois, and Vanda, Illinois. And uh, I love what you're doing. That's fantastic. People Thank really you. appreciate the fact to see what they're buying, feel what they're buying, and experience what they're buying before they buy, you know, and, sure. and I always tell everybody, buy the telescope you're going to use the most. And, good you know, advice. Hmm. good advice. So. Great. Well, thank you, Mackenzie. I'm going to, I'm going to turn yeah. the spotlight over to uh, Randy here. So uh, thanks for giving us your experience uh, so far. And we're going to check back in on you uh, probably after you give that event at the uh, Fort Worth Science Center. So you take care. All right. OK, well, Randy, uh, you and I kind of bounce back and forth uh, uh, throughout the day. And uh, uh, it was it was, uh, you know, uh, great to hear about your story. But uh, so you run a shop that's obviously successful okay and you're not do you're not a web you don't have a website uh for for this so how do you make it work you're but i i also know we talked a little bit about uh people waking up uh to the sky and all of that and uh you know you've been involved in in astronomy since you were a teenager um that was just a couple of years ago but uh you know <laughs> But what 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 do you 
tell us more about looking up optics. Well, okay. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Okay. Um, I am have been an amateur astronomer since I was 14. That first look at Orion hooked me, and ever since, astronomy journey has been with me. Um, I am a master naturalist and a master gardener through the U of I extension um, here in Illinois, and I just love nature. I am president of the Riverbend Astronomy Club, so I do a lot of outreach with them, and they also have a library telescope program. I'm on the board of directors of the St. Louis Astronomical Society, so I do a lot of outreach with them, and um, they're also heavily involved in the library telescope program. So, you know, other than that, I started this business six years ago with the purpose of, uh, you know, people being able to come and experience, like I said, what they're buying. I do do star parties here at the shop. My shop is located on my property. I have a separate building mm -hmm. on my property that I was able to put my shop in. So that makes it to where people can call for an appointment anytime, night or day, and I can go out and uh, share astronomy with them and let them try out a piece of equipment that they may want to awesome. buy. That's awesome. So, so that, that helps a lot too in that respect. In fact, that's kind of the way I work my shop since I do do a lot of other things. I A lot of people call for an appointment because they're driving two or three hours to get here. And, you know, they'll spend two or three hours here just looking at different things. I've got a bunch of eyepieces and, you know, they can try out different things before they buy. And that way they know what route they want to go. So that is awesome. Uh, yeah, you I do, can't try do that really online. You know, you can't you can't get no. like you can't get an expert like yourself, right? And no one's going to. You can't duplicate someone going out with you, letting you try a piece of equipment. You know, so I mean, it's it's um, you know, I imagine at one point or another we'll be buying our cars and our houses and everything just online. You know, maybe, yeah. you know, but. Uh, uh, or trying that you, you can you can buy clothes and stuff like that online, shoes online, but and I know people who do that, but they're constantly returning stuff. You know, they go, oh yeah, that didn't really fit, doesn't really look good on me, whatever. You know, um, so I, I think it's uh, very valuable um, to have this uh, really tactile approach. And then through the shop, like I said, I'll have star parties out here. People want to learn astrophotography. I have friends who really do a wonderful job with astrophotography. So they'll come out here because I do have dark skies. I live kind of out in the country and uh, they, they do a lot of astrophotography and people can go around and learn from them because there may be eight, nine guys out here shooting different objects in the night sky. And then I do sky orienteering at some nature centers for master naturalists and anybody to come to and learn the constellations different times of the years. So it's really been a journey and experience and I, I don't regret it. I just got to thank my lovely wife for letting me do this crazy stuff. <laughs> That's great. That's great. I would ask you, I mean, you're retired now. Uh, what was your background before you got into this? I was a re retail store manager, and then at one time I was VP of sales for some warehouses, and then I uh, did sales and routes for a guy back here in town. And I retired once earlier, and I decided I was going to go back to work, and I did landscaping for 10 years because I always did that on the side, and uh, that was going to be just – mowing and taking care of 10 people's things that lots at the lake. I ended up having five employees and you know how that goes. So, right. and then my health went south on me. So I had to retire from that. So, hmm. well, you look healthy to us. So, you know, and uh, I, I'm, I'm one of those guys that personally thinks that astronomy is good for you, you know, 
health-wise, yes. mentally-wise, everything. Would you agree with that? I mean, is that a is that a wild statement to make? No, it's it's super relaxing. It's just I don't know. It's almost like a religious experience. Experience. Right. I mean, it's you know, it is. It's really a relaxing hobby. It's an enjoyable hobby, and like I said, the journey just keeps. It it never gets old. Things change so much That's right. you know, with technology and, and everything else. So right. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Now the community of people that come and see you. Now I said you didn't have a website, but that was I now find out that was a lie. Okay. And I just yes, posted I your website up there. So it is looking up dot uh info, I think is what it is, it, right? It's just a basic website that it's yeah. plain. No, it's a it's a nice website. It shows where you are, it says what you carry. That's great, you know, so very good. Yeah, yeah, and I am located at 1261 U.S. Highway 40 in Vandalia, Illinois, um, 62471. Um, you know, my email address is looking, L-O-O-K-I-N actually is how looking, I'm looking. Right. Yeah, it's looking with an apostrophe, up optics, and my website is looking up, looking UPOP at gmail.com is my business website. So, okay. If you're ever in the area, call me, stop by. I We're having a little freeze frame going on here, but um, this is great. Uh, and I'm going to recommend uh, if, if you are making, you know, you get out and uh, you um, are able to uh, uh, stop by a place like this. It's just unusual, you know, and so uh, highly recommend it. And I can tell that uh, Randy Harrison is uh, the, the kind of guy that uh, you'd want to learn more from. So Randy, if you're watching this on YouTube, <laughs> thanks for, for, for coming on. Um, our, uh, our next speaker is uh, Byron Labadee. Now, Byron has been involved in astronomy outreach for a long time. Uh, he loves it. Uh, he, is, uh, uh, he was actually on live with us on the last Global Star Party, uh, standing there with an audience with Don Davies as they were inside the big telescope in uh, Chile. And I think that is the topic of his talk today. He's going to share his experience there. Byron, thank you for coming on to Global Star Party. Well, it's really a pleasure uh, for you to invite me and to see you. And a, a heartfelt hello to uh, all the people that are attending and participating. It's uh, truly an honor, and I'm very humbled to be here. We're, we're honored to have you. Thank you. Well, well I started out uh, 10 years old, got the astronomy bug. Uh, got interested not only in amateur astronomy, but uh, just very, very inquisitive person from the get-go. So I also wanted to explore professional astronomy, and I've made uh, been fortunate to make trips uh, to several observatories globally. Uh, in my youth, high school, ever since I got a driver's license, I spent days, weeks, even months at... Uh, Kitt Peak National Observatory and a big solar observatory in New Mexico and was in the army in El Paso. So I befriended Clyde Tombaugh and spent quite a few days wow. at his house visiting with his family and wow. That's him, awesome. uh, teaching me a lot of stuff. So I've been fortunate. Uh, having said that, I've been to so many of these observatories. I was uh, finally selected for the Astronomy in Chile Educator Ambassadors Program or ACAP and now anybody globally can participate by filling out an application form. You don't have to be a genius or a professor, just have a passion. And they can be found, uh, the, the applications can be found through uh, searching ACAP or astroambassadors.com. But my discussion uh, is will be astronomy in Chile, which um, was probably of all the experience I've had, the pinnacle of them all, it was just absolutely uh, unbelievable. So I'm going to bring up my PowerPoint and we'll get started. Okay, well, on day one, our 
team met at the uh, National Science Foundation, Associated Universities, Inc., and uh, National Radio Astronomy offices in Santiago, Chile. And uh, from there, all of us uh, were told about the telescopes, the observatories, the staff, and the great deal of time and amount of money that these entities spend on public outreach. Um, they really do want to get the message out. and They'd like to get the youth uh, to pursue careers in STEM sciences. Mm -hmm. uh, after our introduction, we all boarded an airplane and flew north 250 miles to the city of La Serena, Chile, stayed overnight. And the next day, the team of us boarded trucks and drove about 60 miles to the astronomer's housing at Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory. Uh, and our first, our, our first visit, we left from there and uh, went over to Cerro Pachon, which is home to the Gemini Telescope, uh, the, the SOAR or South uh, Southern Astrophysical Research uh, Observatory and the under oh, construction. Oh. Hey, um, something I, I wanted to, uh, you might be, are you sharing a, are you think you're sharing a presentation at this point? Yes, yes. Okay, it's not sharing. So, oh, oh, okay. yeah, let's, let's correct that. Can you see it? Not yet. Okay. Oh, boy. All right. Let's see okay. how this. I have done this myself many times. So, okay. All right. <laughs> uh, let me uh, show. I have lots of other embarrassing things I can tell you about, too, if you'd like. So, okay. Um, so, on, on the Zoom, uh, uh, application that you have, you'll see a share screen button. It's in green. Okay. All see right. That guy. Then yeah. you go and you click on your presentation. Okay. I'll make sure you get it. There we go. That looks like it's starting to work. There we go. Mm, okay. okay. So you, we're seeing your documents well, live. You, you see, I'm um, excited. That's what it yeah, is. Yeah. Yeah. That's that for sure. Okay. I got so excited one time giving a presentation to the Rotary Club. This is in the 1980s when we used, uh, uh, you know, slide projectors with the carousel. And right. I'm holding on to the remote control in my hand. Now, this remote control probably has a length of about, with a cord length of about three feet. And I throw up my hands to express how big the universe is. And the projector comes crashing to the floor. It breaks the, the light, okay? And all <laughs> the slides fly out all over in front of all these businessmen. <laughs> well, I can get us. I cut said, off. and that concludes my presentation. <laughs> that, that, that will work. <laughs> As I, I'm picking up my, my slides. Now. So now that I made a, a, a fool of myself and shown my true intelligence. No, that's cool. That's we'll cool. resume, and I get yeah. The the the, the everybody the, can see them now. Yeah, the passion already came through. So here we go. That was the important um, part. The, the cohorts, and this is a picture actually taken uh, during the so, Yeah, so, so you went out of sharing. Yeah. yeah so you, you got to go back in. Okay. Uh, we uh, share. Okay, it looks like can we right, see. now you're back in. There now you go. See. And bring that into uh, presentation mode. That's the yep. little screen here. Yes, yeah, sir. Perfect. All right. Okay. All right. Back in the saddle. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I've already described this. We met at the main offices. Uh, we were all given presentations. The nine of us that were selected. Uh, we got on the plane and we went to La Serena, which is kind of near the mm -hmm. uh, about a third up from the bottom left. It shows Cerro Tololo and Cerro Pachon. Uh, we then we went first to the telescopes there. Um, the first telescope we went to was uh, Gemini Telescope, and here's the home to the at present world's largest single mirror. It's an 8.1 inch meter or uh, 319 inch diameter objective lens is a Ritchie Cretion Cassegrain. Uh, the mirror is made of Corning low expansion glass and it has a suite of four optical infrared imagers, spectrographs, wow. 
guidance instruments located on the back. They're all there together, which will uh, quickly and easily allow for switching of the instruments without pulling them off and putting them back on. Uh, we really need a accurate mirror surface. So they uh, were able to get this one down to 0 0.6 millionths of an inch wow. in smoothness. Uh, Gemini South, as I said, has a 319 inch telescope and they also have a uh, mirror refinish or recoding facility there. Uh, mm -hmm. It's um, optimized for observations in the mid-infrared by use of laser guide adaptive optics, and they use a silver mirror. Uh, there's several layers of mirror, mirror coatings, and on all of them, there's a silica-based final layer that slows down the oxidizing process that tarnishes the mirrors and uh, allows them to recoat the mirror two to three years. Now, for a telescope this size and a rich accretion, F1.0 <clears throat> made of a concave hyperboloid is, blows my mind. I yeah, wish I had an extremely it. fast mirror. Yeah, I'd like to have one of my cameras attached to that. I think it captures something in a pretty short exposure. Absolutely. Yeah. So, from there, we went to nearby, the, on the same mountain, the SOAR, Southern Astrophysical Research Telescope, with, within which there's a 4.1 meter, 161-inch F6.6 rich accretion with two Nasmith and, and three folded Cassegrain foci. If those for you not familiar with Nasmith, it's simply that instead of the uh, focal point being reflected back through a central hole in the primary mirror, which it can be, there is a uh, opening in the side of the telescope similar to that of a Newtonian near the center. And this uh, design allows uh, heavy equipment to be positioned uh, on the telescope. Mm. And as the telescope moves, the mirror can be adjusted by a whole bunch of attenuators to move the mirrors so that it doesn't the, the mirrors move instead of the the uh, instruments so that it doesn't throw the balance off on, on the, uh, the the telescope uh, the it too is made of uh, Corning low expansion glasses out alt azimuth design and it is designed to work from uh, the atmospheric cutoff in the blue end of the spectrum at 320 nanometers to near infrared. Wow. And this telescope is among the foremost research facilities and produces the best image quality and optical infrared and spectroscopic capabilities uh, of pretty much all of the telescopes in the world. And that is a fiberglass dome, believe it or not. Wow. Here's a interior view of uh, the SOAR telescope and the equipment operating room. Uh, then the Vera C. Rubin, which you can see is under construction and a very unique design. Uh, looks more like of a cruise ship to me. Yeah, it's beautiful. Actually, actually Look at that. a telescope. And... Uh, it's um, maintained by National Science Foundation, and uh, it's called the Simoni Survey Telescope as the Simo Simoni family donated a vast amount of money towards the uh, expenses to build this telescope. Verubin Observatory was previously referred to as the Synoptic Survey Telescope. Uh, the word synoptics derived from Greek meaning view and gives a very uh, broad view of a subject, uh, 3.5 degrees uh, in a view. Uh, Vera Rubin was a woman astronomer who pioneered the discovery of galaxy rotations and their rates. Uh, the observatory will house a 8.4 meter, 331 inch telescope, which will then be the largest in the world, but will soon be beat 
by other telescopes under constructions. It's able to photograph the entire available sky every few nights. Wow. Um, it, uh, it uses 15 terabytes of data a, a night. And it's a variant of a three-mirror anastigmat, which simply means that it eliminates blurring which allows a compact telescope to deliver a very sharp image over the very wide field of view that I told you about earlier. Uh, the camera is has the largest digital camera ever constructed. Uh, it's operated uh, under management of AURA and the full survey operations are scheduled to begin in October, 2024. And this telescope is going to catalog 90% of near Earth objects larger than 300 meters and assess the threats they pose to life on Earth. And uh, it will find uh, some 10,000 primitive objects within the Kuiper belt. Mm. Uh, wow, is that the camera? That is the sensor. Yes, that's the Jeez. camera. That is huge. <laughs> yeah. It will be observing thousands of supernova, both nearby and at large redshift. And by measuring the distribution of dark matter throughout gravitational lensing or by gravitational lensing. Hmm. And uh, if you're not familiar with it, you can look it up on the internet because my time frame doesn't allow me to get into these specific details. Hmm. Uh, this telescope makes no attempt to compensate for atmospheric dispersion because such correction would require readjustment of additional elements in the optical train. And uh, this telescope moves in five second increments between pointings. Uh, so it'll take a 10 second exposure or a 15 second exposure and allows five seconds to move and settle down before it starts another uh, set of two um, images and uh, shorter wavelengths will have the shorter is... wavelengths will have reduced image quality because it doesn't have the compensator for the dispersion but still nonetheless with an image of that size it's going to be good yeah uh now the LST, LSST project numbers, uh, 8.4 meter primary, 3,200 megapixels. You know, my camera's got 36. Hmm. It has a focal ratio of F1.23. Wow. Uh, 800 times the number, uh, same objects will be captured. And uh, you can see the information there uh, at 15 terabytes, as I said, collected every night uh, each exposure is 20 seconds with a five second interval in between uh, there are 189 ccd ccd uh, charge couple device detectors each with 16 megapixels and alerts are produced within 60 seconds of observation on objects that have changed brightness or position relative to archived images of the same star position. 10 million alerts will be generated per night. So we're talking serious business wow. about identifying objects in the Kuiper belt that could pose a threat to hum human life. Uh, Rumen has a program for ab education public outreach and serves four main categories, the general public, formal educators, citizen science and principal investigators and uh, continent developers at informal science education facilities. Now back, we went to Cerro Tololo. Uh, Seattle is located in the Coimbo region of Northern Chile. The principal telescope with the silver dome is the four meter Victor M. Blanco, Blanco telescope named after the Puerto Rican astronomer, Victor Blanco, who discovered Blanco one a galactic cluster in 1951. He and his wife also pioneered research into stellar populations within the center of our galaxy and our uh, nearby Magellanic Cloud uh, parent galaxies. He was also the second director of this observatory complex. 
Victor Blanco is an exact twin of the one at Kitt Peak. And the reason it's exactly the same was to save time and money. All of the engineering design parts, uh, stencils, everything was known. Uh, the, the mirror cast was available so they could quickly uh, uh, construct this telescope and get to Cerro Tulo with uh, saving a lot of money at the same time. And if any of you are astrophotographers and familiar about taking flat frames, most of these telescope domes now, if you'll see, have behind the telescope to the left, a flat frame uh, screen. That white, that white yep. circle mm -hmm. thing that's, okay. Yeah. Then the telescope is pointed at that. It's the same size as the objective mirror. And they take their flats with that before doing optical imaging. Um, this telescope is used primarily for dark energy surveys. The dark camera on the Blanco telescope is currently the main research instrument. It's called the DCAM, has a CCD imager mounted at prime focus, the major components in it. Look at that engineering, that guy's standing in there. It's just the... <laughs> wow. He's just... Who, whoever designs and fabricates and puts... See, astronomy isn't just the astronomers. It's this team that puts all of this incredible equipment together. But there are 62 science CCDs, eight wavefront CCDs, and four guide CCDs with an amplifier. Uh, this camera's found 12 more Jovian moons, a giant comet in the outer solar system, the fastest orbiting asteroid, an extreme dwarf planet, and new stellar streams confirming the melting pot history of the galaxy. Oh, wow. Uh, there are four different smart telescopes, which means uh, small to uh, moderate, um, uh, small to moderate aperture research telescopes. Uh, there's a 1.5 meter, a 1.3 meter, a one meter and a 0.9 meter. It's a consortium. Uh, this one, this one, this one, and one not seen. Tenet telescopes, they're everywhere. I had no idea there were so many telescopes. A lot of them have the clamshell domes you see to the left. Others have ash domes. Um, they range in size between 0.4 and 1.6 meters, uh, including the Korean microlensing telescope, which is the larger one. And all of the remaining telescopes are shared by universities. Lucky students at public schools in North Carolina. I don't know why that state got the long straw, but that's great. And some of them are actually for rental from the general public for imaging. Uh, now we're going to go to the radio telescopes. Uh, uh, we went to uh, ALMA, large which is the large millimeter, sub-millimeter array, uh, further north in the Atacama Desert. It's at 16,400 feet. And the reason being is radio telescopes hate moisture. And at that altitude, altitude you're above a lot of the atmosphere. You're going to have low humidity, and you're going to get better imaging than if you had a lot of vapor in the air. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lower side at 10,000 feet where the transporters, computers, maintenance facilities and everything are located. And the computer they use to analyze the data is the equivalent to 3 million uh, laptop or desktop computers that people use. Oh, uh, it gets hot, see? So they have to keep this in an enclosed room at 35 degrees Fahrenheit so it doesn't burn itself up. Hmm. Uh, the, there are telescopes operated um, by the USA, Europe, and Japan, and these dishes range in size from 12 meters to 7 meters across. There's 66 total antenna, and they can be spread around with those specialized trucks to as far away as 16 kilometers apart. Uh, that spread would makes them the equivalent to one very, very large radio antenna. Uh, this is a photograph of one of the transporters, 28 wheels hauling uh, the teles one of the radio telescopes from the low site to the high site. I don't know how the engineers do it, but these things move 
instantly and quickly. They're very heavy, and I don't know how they designed the gear trains and the parts that move to where they can just snap move and stop on a dime, but the engineering's incredible. Um, as I said, the great distance uh, between the dishes bring more, more detail uh, and act as one large dish. Uh, the difference, and you see we all had to wear supplemental oxygen, even though we were tested uh, physiologically at the lower site. But the difference between a radio telescope and an optical telescope is the wavelength of the radiation collected. Optical telescopes only capture a very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum, roughly the cutoff uh, in the blue of 340 nanometers up to uh, visible red at 750 nanometers. Allman contrast probes the sky at longer wavelengths from a few hundred microns to about one millimeter, which is about 1000 times longer than visible light in the spectrum. It operates primarily in the lower end of uh, the uh, radio waves. Uh, these uh, mirrors are made out of a unique material. They're not metallic, so they don't, uh, they're not metals, so they don't undergo expansion and contraction. They're not malleable. They're not distortable uh, because, they, because they have to have a circus, surface accuracy within 25 microns thick, far less than a single sheet of paper. Uh, across the entire dish, be it seven or 12 me uh, meters. All these telescopes use radio telescope interferometry, and it's kind of interesting because when two antenna dishes look at the sky, the, they're positioned uh, apart from each other. So there's a tiny fraction of the second that the uh, waves coming in or the signals is a bit off. And when you combine them with a the computer, they overlap or interfere with each other, which is where, where the word interferometry is derived from. But by precisely timing of the signal from each of these antenna, astronomers can correct them so they don't interfere. And this is known as interferometry. With interferometry, radio astronomers can combine all of these signals from the antennas and, and telescopes. And it, first you take an image, then you distort it and make it all fuzzy. But when you reassemble it, it's sharper and brighter than ever. So it's a, a, an amazing thing. Uh, optical telescopes use uh, mirrors and lasers to make interference pattern and form a speckle and the telescope and uh, computers analyze different portions of the spread out pattern pattern to get all the details and then when they put it back together all those little details become clear that's awesome and so that is thank you not all the telescopes but most of I, them. yeah there's so much to talk about i i was uh i was at the ctio uh for that eclipse that happened a couple of years ago and it was just uh an amazing facility. Uh, I also visited the uh, Victor Blanco telescope as well. It's massive, it's beautiful. Um, but the thing I thought was um, really, I mean, what I was left with, and I think that you were left with this too, Byron, is um, that, uh, you know, was the, the entire team, all the way down to the people that supply food to the astronomers and the cafeteria, which by the way is great. You know, the yes. food is awesome. Yeah. CIO. Uh, we stayed up there uh, at the at the summit uh, during the entire time getting ready for the eclipse. I'm curious, Byron, did you, what did you, what was your take on observing the Southern Hemisphere sky? I don't think it was your first time, but um, no. But what, it, what it, do you think <laughs> about uh, the Milky Way down there? I've uh, been to the Southern Hemisphere many times, and uh, the first thing I notice, and everybody says, look at Orion, it's upside down. That's that's the first thing <laughs> they notice. It's very disorienting uh, the first uh, time. That's the true. Mag the Magellanic Clouds. You can't see it from here, so every time you see them, you're, you look at them in amazement. Uh, one of the greatest uh, um, cluster of stars is Omega Centauri, or... 
oh, two can yeah. of two can of 47 visible from there and the beauty about being in the southern hemisphere is from there you're looking into the milky way directly into the center of our galaxy which right. you're not able to do so much from the northern hemisphere it's very low so I can't go south enough times to ever be fully satisfied. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I have a question. At that elevation, how far north are you able to see? Because I've heard there are some spots where you can you can go all the way down to our dipper in the north from Chile. Now, I don't know if you're quite that high, but I'm pretty sure you can, at that elevation, you're seeing a few northern targets still, too. Well, let me explain that to you. Um, being at elevation, even on Mount Everest, uh, com as compared to the entirety of the Earth, the Earth is as smooth as any man-made circular object you can make. So being on a mountaintop makes no difference whatsoever. The true divining factor of what you're going to see uh, above the horizon or at the horizon is your latitude how far south of the equator how far north you are the, due to the curvature of the earth that's the only thing that is allows you to change what you're able to see at any given time uh, any portion of the night sky okay with that said i've had someone mention actually on global star party catching a glimpse of the dipper from some places in Chile, so or Chile, that, that um, may be possible. That may be possible. The, and that's, from, from the United States, you can also see things like Omega Centauri, for example. Okay, true. Yeah, um, down here, down in Florida, for instance. Yeah, right. That's right. right. So there are there is a little bit of overlap. You can get I don't know seventy percent of the sky, something like that. So uh, you know, if you got good clear horizon, you can see pretty far down. So. Um, but uh, Byron, I want to thank you for coming on to Global Star Party and uh, uh, sharing your experience in Chile with us and uh, looking forward to having you on again. So, Thank you. And I apologize for the hiccup. This was the first time I did a PowerPoint. No, it's, it's absolutely fine. It, it, it's absolutely you, fine. Excellent job. Trial by fire. <laughs> I'm humbled. Thank you very much. Thanks, Byron. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, is Ed Seaman. Now, Ed uh, is one of the main organizers of the Northeast Astronomy Forum. This is the world's largest um, astronomy show, totally dedicated to uh, telescopes and observatories and tours of the, that you can go to and all the rest of it. Uh, I've been going for a number of years. Um, I'm happy to say I'm coming back uh, to Northeast Astronomy Forum, and we brought Ed to um, the Global Star Party to talk about it, and in the hopes, too, that you will uh, make that trip to Suffern, New York. Ed, it's all yours, man. Well, thank you, Scott. It's a uh, pleasure to uh, be here with all of you, um, and uh, uh, thank you for that early plug with Chuck Allen. That was great. <laughs> um, so, we are extremely pleased to announce that NEF is back live for 2023 after three years of the pandemic, uh, April 15th and 16th um, in Suffern, New York. Um, we have a fantastic show uh, that we're putting together uh, for the event. And um, as um, Scott had said, uh, NEF is uh, the world's largest astronomy and space expo, and it's features <clears throat> over a uh, hundred manufacturers and vendors from all over the world, um, all at our uh, 90,000 square foot exhibit hall. So it's a truly huge event as far as, um, I don't want to uh, refer to it as a telescope show, but boy, we got lots of telescopes. Yeah, lots of telescopes <laughs> there, that's right. <laughs> And, uh, Scott's going to be providing a, a good portion of them for sure. <laughs> for sure. Uh, so That's Scott's right. been a great supporter um, over the years and uh, appreciate his uh, participation. But um, uh, we'd like to see Randy and McKinsey there as well. So <laughs> it's an open invitation for you guys to come and uh, uh, visit or exhibit uh, at the show uh, for certain. Um, in addition to um, 
the major uh, exhibit floor. Um, we also have a fantastic lineup of uh, speakers uh, for the event. Um, this year we have, uh, to mention a few, uh, Eileen Collins, who's the first female shuttle commander. Um, we have, yeah, we have, uh, very proud to have Jerry Griffin, uh, Apollo flight director uh, from the golden years. Uh, very, very happy to have him. Um, we also have Nagin Cox, who Scott was uh, very instrumental in helping us get. She's the um, JPL systems engineer for the Mars rover missions. Um, if you see me looking around, I'm looking at my various screens. That's okay. Information. There's a lot going on at NEF. Yeah, there's a lot going on. You know? I, got, I got stuff everywhere. That's right. <laughs> um, we have uh, also Jenny uh, Renbaugh, uh, who is um, working on the uh, the new um, the new uh, Dragonfly mission, uh, mm. Saturn's moon. Titan. Cool. Um, it's a, um, a copter type device, and mm -hmm. she's going to be here to talk all about that. Uh, very interesting project. Um, and um, I'm also happy to say that we just added Holly Writings, uh, who is NASA's first woman flight director and has just taken the role of lead for NASA's Gateway Project. Awesome. Which is um, as you all know, the first manned uh, space station to orbit the moon. Mm. Uh, so that's going to be an amazing talk. And uh, we also just added uh, Don Thomas, who's a four flight space shuttle veteran. Uh, so we're excited to have him. <clears throat> and now I'm looking up at my board and uh, I've got some additional people that I can't mention just yet because they're not confirmed but uh, we're very close to confirming them and some very very exciting guests uh, names names that you'll all um, recognize so it's going to be a fantastic show this year and we're, we're so glad to uh, be uh, bringing it back to you live um, in addition to those things that I've mentioned we have a pro-am conference which goes on within the um, uh, uh, the convention. Um, we have STEM workshops for students as well as educators, uh, beginners classes. We got a little bit of um, everything for everybody. Um, it's it's a great event, and if you have including an astrophotography conference too, correct? And the astrophotography conference, which uh, takes place the two days prior to me, so that would be um, uh, the thirteenth and fourteenth. Um, and, uh, you could read more about that. We have a lot of, um, uh, astrophotographers that have been doing fantastic work for many, many years that are going to be presenting, um, at the conference and, uh, um, telling us all their secrets to their fantastic photographs that they take. Right. Uh, that's an amazing event, um, in itself. And um, you can see all this information in much more detail at our website, uh, which is um, nefexpo.com. That's right. Yeah, I posted that um, website there. And I want to ask you something. Sure. Uh, uh, you've been doing this for many years. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, so I, I think you kind of have a somewhat unique uh, perspective on kind of our whole community. What are you left with? I mean, after, you know, when someone asks you, gosh, Ed, what, what do you, you know, what is this uh, neat thing that you do? You know, someone that's not into astronomy, what do you tell them? Um, well, I, I usually, I usually take one of my program books here and say, refer to page, uh, Four. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all these pictures. <laughs> and, right. And everything is there. But I mean, basically what it is, is it's 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 a gathering of uh, astronomy and space enthusiasts mm -hmm. um, that come to 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 shop, that come to listen to world class lectures um, and just uh come to uh to to meet and and network i mean it's a fantastic event for for 
all of those things. And I mean, nobody really comes away from Neef disappointed. If you have no. even the slightest bit of interest in in um, astronomy, space, and science in general, you're just going to be um, astounded by by what you see and and hear at the event. Absolutely. You know, it's the only event that I've seen for uh, astronomy and amateur astronomers where you're driving to the event and you see billboards, okay, on the side of the road, <laughs> right. okay, about Neef. And you see, um, you know, you guys uh, do uh, live streaming from Neef and you do, yes, you do everything. You guys have been such innovators uh, in the presentation of astronomy for the space enthusiasts, for the amateur astronomers, for kids, you know, that are just kind of getting, you know, interested, just getting started. You have recognition awards, door prize, all kinds of stuff. It's hard. It's, it, it is the burning man, okay, of, <laughs> of, <laughs> of astronomy. Or certainly like one that. of the main, the main things. <laughs> yeah. Right. Except I don't think you guys catch anything on fire yet. So, yeah, no, no. right. Well, very cool. Ed, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I thank think you, at this Scott. point. So, yep. Yep. Go thank online, you. everybody, and uh, ticket sales are open. Uh, awesome. Expo.com. Uh, check it out. Uh, and uh, get your tickets for uh, April 15th and 16th. We hope to see you there. Yeah, I got mine. So we'll okay. see you there. It's great. <laughs> All okay. right. So thanks so much. Uh, we are going to take a 10 minute break and then we'll be coming back with Connell Richards, uh, who's been away for a little while, but is a great speaker. And he'll be talking about the great eclipse party. So. <laughs> É Polina, sou eu. There's a question on chat about trust tube Dobbs versus a rigid tube. Um, and you mentioned outside of portability. Um, I think there are some there are some other differences. The portability is the one that I'm uh, most aware of, as well as um, well your mirror the mirrors all eventually get to the temperature of the outside but with that truss tube especially if you if you leave your truss tube open and with a without a shawl on it then that mirror gets cooler sooner um 
you know, it settles down to whatever the temperature is where you're observing. So, um, yeah, Book Davies, just cool factor, literally cool factor. It's your, if your mirror comes in and it's too hot, you know, cooling it, open truss helps it cool down some, but then, but then if you have your open trusses and you're somewhere where there's light, it may interfere with your views of the sky. So more often than not, you uh, cover your uh, truss scope with a shawl and you then you have less reflected extra light coming from the outside. So um, I see more truss tubes, just simply the, the portability factor makes a difference when you got an 18 inch scope uh being able to carry it in a cell and take the trusses off is huge um book you're saying for mirrors 12 inches or less temperature isn't a big issue i'd go down to about eight um i have an 11 inch in a schmidt casa grain and it struggles to get to ambient temperature my views start off rather slow and they start to lock in over time um 18 inch scope um i've seen the horse head nebula directly and thor's helmet directly there were some filters to filters put on but um it was amazing seeing both the horse head you normally see it as an image in the you know an image but when you see it with your eyes it does something to you uh, you're on uh yep you're on mute byron but uh yeah you you've seen that horse head with your with your eyes too no and that's why i'm mind blown yeah see it uh see it uh naked eye and you're like i'm looking directly at something that I, uh, you don't and from what I understand, skies of Bortle two or higher, where you are, where you were in Chile, I think those skies are dark enough. You stick that, you you stick a visual uh, tube eighteen inches or more out there, you'll see it. Um, I think there is a filter you have to put on there. I forget what the, I don't know if it's UHC or, you know, yeah. but hey, Adrian, I've seen what you really need is dark transparent skies and low real okay. low power and uh i've seen the horse head I've seen which way the no nose is pointing okay uh -huh. through an eight inch telescope it's possible and i know people have seen it with the six inch so it is absolutely possible to do it is very okay. faint i mean it's almost like a ghostly kind of look thing to look at you know yeah. but, uh, uh, it is I, it is absolutely possible i agree I saw it this past uh, Okie Tech's trip that I took. Um, gentleman had an 18-inch obsession. And uh, I, for the life of me, I can't remember the filter he used. But we looked in there. I saw it. Like you said, you see the direction that the nose is pointing in the horse head. And yeah. Yeah, you may not make out a lot of details, but it sticks up. It yeah. sticks out there, and you're, you're looking directly at it. So it's... Uh, you know it for those of you in the comment you know the bigger for visual observation the bigger aperture mirrors are still king dark skies oh um, nothing replaces aperture but nothing replaces aperture and nothing replaces nothing replaces those, a really truly dark sky yeah those transparent dark skies like you've seen byron yeah. in uh chile um it's it's part of the reason that many are going going into astrophotography um yeah. just because well it, it gives them access to more deep sky objects and lesser skies I, I can't go to kenton i can't drive you know out west or i can't go down south to a place like chile um but i want to see it so so i take my camera and hook it to a tracker go for uh 60 seconds and boom there it is that little horse head sitting right there underneath on the tack and the flame over here right um 
Yeah, Wes. Yeah. Uh, Wes is talking about the uh, big mirrors and the uh, the Omega. Yeah, the Omega looks good in almost any aperture. Oh yeah. But yeah. the bigger it is, the more you know, like any anything else, the more detail you can uh, see. Norm, you've seen the Veil Nebula through a large dob. I've seen it through my 11 inch. I saw the Eastern Veil, no filter. Also saw the uh, NGC 7293, the Helix Nebula. Saw it without a filter. We had a pretty good night. I think the SQM reading was 21.99 at one point going straight up. We were close to a true Bortle 1, but uh, they reserved Bortle 1 for 22.0 and and on up. Well, Adrian, you'll be happy to know that recently there's a new maker of some daubs. And for the... Mm, not too horrible price of a half a million dollars. You can now buy a 60 inch dob. That's right. <laughs> Someone is selling a 60 inch dob. That's, That's it. Is it so? Is it a trust tube or is uh, it, it's it, available, it, Adrian, through Explore Scientific? Ah, okay. Oh, so, so Scott, I'm coming to the guy that sells. Yeah, you come on down. We'll we'll hook you yeah. up here. So I, I'll bring you a cashier's check. <laughs> okay, bring. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring the truck. I don't know if a pickup yeah. truck is enough yeah. to carry it home. But... What's What's remarkable? What's remarkable is that um, that the uh, uh, telescope can be built in just a little over a year, and uh, you know it's robotic. Uh, but uh, and it doesn't require a giant ladder to get up to the eyepiece, so that's, that's even better. That's another that's another thing. But uh, you could actually the, do the world of amateur today. astronomy and the gear they can have today uh, is just simply stunning. And um, uh, you know we're going to have a show, uh, uh, Global Star Party, is just going to talk about the whole theme is going to be about astronomy and the technology behind it. You know for you know yeah. probably mostly focused on the amateur world because it's. Amateurs have now at their disposal amazing equipment that, you know, multi-million dollar technology that they can buy for a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars. You want to get big? Uh, it's out there for it's you. But that crazy. used to be only available to professionals. I mean, and now it's, you know, if you got the dough, okay, you can do it. So, so Randy, what's your take on that question we had in the chat? The uh, tube versus a truss. And if there's other advantages besides portability is a big advantage in my book, but they were asking if there were any other advantages. Um, um, tube is a lot bigger, a lot bulkier. I think portability is, is probably, uh, you know, I have a explore scientific that I demo a lot. That is a truss. And with those fans running, I go to the Illinois dark sky party. I never put a shroud on it. Those mm-hmm. fans keep the dew off. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you have to put a shroud on your truss if you're in doing public outreach in a lighted area. Yeah. So I yeah. would say the truss is just so much more lightweight. I got a guy who just bought a 16 inch explore scientific and he puts it in a little Honda. And goes everywhere to dark sides <laughs> with it, you know. Great. That just doesn't sound <laughs> like it. Be, it should be possible. Yeah. But so yeah. yeah, so you the can port- take big aperture, you know, a lot of places. And guys, I'm sorry I dropped out. My internet dropped me. That's oh, right. that's okay. The that's internet okay. gremlins they yeah. they happen. Rule America. The guys, we, we need to bring on. History. We need to bring on our next speaker here, so we could. We're, we're, we could absolutely go down the rabbit hole on <laughs> on gear and technology, and we will. Okay, big time uh, in our in a future uh, global star party. We've already got it planned, but I, I do want to introduce uh, uh, Connell Richards. Connell has been on Global Star Party for a couple of years now, uh, and uh, he had to drop out for a little while due to commitments to his education, but. Uh, Connell, thank you for coming back on to Global Star Party again. Of course, I'm I'm very happy to be back. And I have to say with Ed just talking about Neath, I remember going to my first Neath in 2017. And I don't know if you remember, but that's where we first met. I remember shopping around and seeing everybody there. Mm-hmm. And I had to be 13 or 14 at that time. And it's been 
such a, a journey since then. So I'm always very happy to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Great. Thank you. Well, tonight I have for you uh, an interesting story about the last total lunar eclipse we had. That was back in uh, November of last year. So I'm going to set up um, a PowerPoint presentation with some images. I want you to let me know if my audio and, and visuals are OK. Sure. So, I'm going to grab this, share it. Okay, you're sharing. All right, how's Good. this looking? Perfect. It's perfect. Yep. Wonderful. So to set the stage here, um, we had that uh, first lunar eclipse of the year in May of last year, and that that turned out to be quite satisfying. It was beautiful where I was. I remember we had a webcast here, everybody sharing images and, and this and that. We were fortunate enough to get another one. So I was kind of playing around with different ideas for what I could do. My plan was uh, I thought I would find some parks in the area. Um, Penn State has a beautiful arboretum that that unfortunately was closed at the time. Uh, so it was it was really hard to get a good spot to take a picture of this. And I thought I'll go out with my camera, get a couple of shots and see what I can use around campus as uh, a prop to, to get some good images. And it was Sunday night. The eclipse was on Tuesday. And I was coming back from a caving trip with a couple of friends and we're all exhausted from, you know, being covered in mud and squeezing through all these cracks under the ground and all that kind of stuff, uh, which is a, a fun thing to do if you ever get the chance to try. But we're talking in the car and I said, hey, I'm going out um, very early Tuesday morning, about 3.30 in the morning. And I knew a lot of my friends enjoyed the outdoors like I did and various aspects of nature. So I said, you're more than welcome to join me. I'll be grabbing some pictures, might bring some binoculars. We'll, we'll look around, we'll have a good time. And to my surprise, a lot of them said, yeah, that's great. I'd love to see you there. Because I, I thought, how how am I going to get college kids out of bed at 3.30 in the morning? Um, but somehow, I guess an eclipse is, is the way to do that. And I, I talked to a couple of friends in the car there. They said they would join. I sent out a message to our larger group. And as we're planning this, uh, I think we had something like 30 or 35 people who were going to show up and did show up. And we all got together to observe this eclipse. You can see in the title slide there, we're standing on uh, the lawn of Old Main. It's a building any Penn Stater would recognize, uh, mm -hmm. anybody from PA, a lot of football fans. Uh, it's quite an iconic building around here. And that ended up being the best place to go uh, to photograph this eclipse, which was not an easy decision to make. Oops, I'll advance here. Um, the site selection was a little bit difficult for where I would observe from, because here we are looking at the eclipse just about as totality is beginning. It was about 10 past four in the morning. And you can see up in the upper left-hand corner, this comes from Sky Safari, uh, the altitude of the moon would be about 15 degrees. We're looking almost due west and it's sinking quite rapidly because um, you're getting to the morning. It's kind of in the winter time. And I wanted to get some good shots of this and not have it blocked by a tree or a building or something. And I knew if I picked the wrong spot where I couldn't see this, I'd have to hike across you know, campus or across town. And that might mean half an hour of me not getting pictures and risking clouds and, and all that kind of thing. So somebody suggested Old Main and we went and scouted it out and it looked like a pretty good option. So you can see here, North is straight up on this picture and we're standing on the lawn um, kind of over to the right here in the middle of that big lawn. Um, you can look west and see the moon moving over those buildings. So it would go kind mm -hmm. of from the bottom to the top as it's setting in the west. And if we positioned ourselves just right, it would set right behind Old Main and right next to that bell tower there and make for some really beautiful photography. So here's what, here's what that building looks like uh, kind of during the day. I got this picture during a snowstorm sometime after. But we ended up seeing the moon kind of come behind that flagpole you see there and just over those trees and over the smokestack and then or over the chimney excuse me and then behind the building so we measured it as best we could uh, with the methods we had and it turned out that we had a good shot all we needed to cooperate was the weather so everybody goes there we get there at 3 30 in the morning uh, one of my friends brought a camp stove he's making some coffee we had a couple of small snacks and it turned into a mini star party at, at that early time in the morning very and so cool. that turned out to be a, a pretty rewarding opportunity to do some outreach there. Um, a lot of my friends, a lot of people who love nature, I, I figured they would enjoy something like this. And it turned out to be a great event. So here we are looking at the beginning of the eclipse. 
And throughout the process, managing the exposure time was a little bit tricky because I wanted to get the lights illuminating uh, from the back, those clock hands and the uh, time numbers on the clock. And then you also have the moon as it's changing in brightness. So trying to get those to even out and get a decent shot with detail on both was tricky. And a little bit before totality, I kind of managed that. But for the time being with the uh, images before and after, I think they worked out okay for the circumstances I, I had there. So you can see there's just a little bit of a dent kind of cutting out of the moon there as that partial uh, eclipse begins, the partial umbral specifically. And then we advance it a little further. Here's a closer shot. I just zoomed in on one of my other pictures and you can see it's a little farther along, um, kind of a fuzzy edge on there, which is a little bit due to the camera and the lens I was using. Uh, but we also had a little bit of cloud cover, a little bit of moisture in the air. Um, I was worried at the time about my camera getting um, kind of moistened up and, and, you know, covered in dew. But I, I kind of lucked out because outside of Old Main, there's two flags. You have the U.S. flag and the state flag. And the lights illuminating them get very hot. So I was able to kind of put the camera next to the light and let that light radiate and mm -hmm. kind of eliminate the dew, which worked out pretty well to get a nice picture of this. And here we go, we're advancing a little bit more and you can kind of see some of that color starting to come in in the Earth's shadow. Uh, you can still see the old main bell tower illuminated pretty well. Um, you can probably even read the time on there. It looks like it's about 10 to four right there um, or 10 to five, I guess. All right. And we're, we're moving in there and, and it was getting just a little bit early in the morning, but that was just beautiful right there trying to get uh, a good shot of that eclipse. Now, later on, um, the moon's just barely a sliver right there as we're about to enter totality. And you can see there's a little bit of a crater there. I think that might be one of the smaller seas. And the moon is almost completely obscured by Earth's shadow. And here I have some pictures uh, where I'm just about at totality. Um, you have all the street lights there, which, which ended up kind of working in my favor because they gave a little bit of illumination to the foreground and made it a little more artistic. Um, I didn't have to worry about, you know, lights getting in the way of my camera or anything. And I ended up getting some beautiful shots with, you can see the moon right oh, there. That that, little that's cool. Left. That is cool. I was, I was thrilled with how this shot came out because, you know, I, I, I was kind of stressed at the end as I was planning out where I should go and where I should plan my images. But I had this vision in my mind of what this shot would look like. And fortunately, um, the circumstances allowed me to execute it. You can see some color in there, a little bit of light just at that limb of the moon and the clock tower pretty well illuminated. Advancing a little further, we have another shot, a little bit more orange in there. Uh, this was later in the eclipse, actually during totality. And I, I was trying to play around with different spots on the lawn where I could get a good shot. And this worked out pretty well. Yeah, there's that's a nice, nice. Oh yeah, thank you. I see there's a nice rich color in the moon there. It looked a little bit darker than the one earlier that year, I thought. Um, it seemed like a, a couple of other people noticed that as well. Just a bit hair, a, a hair darker than mm -hmm. the one in May. I would agree I with you getting, there too. A little it, bit. It sure oh, seemed, man, that's nice. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. You ought to turn that into, Penn, to someone at Penn State's campus, see if they'll post it. I'd, I'd sure love to because uh, I think my next shot at something like this would be around 2025. And um, if all goes to plan, I'm graduated by then. So I'll, I'll have to keep this for a while. Um, certainly a very special picture. You know, I love Penn State. I love the school I go to in astronomy and it all kind of comes together in this image. And it worked out very nicely, especially with these tree branches in the foreground, uh, just adding a little bit of character to that image. Here's another image from Totality. Uh, this one worked out to be a little bit sharper. I had an intervalometer with me. But for some reason, these images weren't coming out as sharp as I liked all the time. So I tried to get as many as I could. And it's right above a chimney there. You can see the bell tower over to the right. Uh, that tree in the foreground just illuminated a little bit. And it kind of looks like that moon is rising out of the chimney there, which I thought was really cool. And here you can see, I thought I got a I thought I'd get a foreground. Um, you can see over to the left, there's a little bit of a blur of people hanging out over there. And they're making coffee and making snacks and kind of camping on the lawn there. There's How some fun. other people in the foreground. Um, a couple others brought cameras and tripods and that kind of thing. Some people had binoculars. 
So we were pretty well equipped to observe something fun like this, and, and it worked out pretty well. Um, it wasn't too chilly. I think it was about 40 or 45 degrees, so just warm enough to be comfortable if you're moving around. And we got a nice shot of that moon getting darker as it's coming down towards the horizon. And anyone who's been to Penn State or seen the campus, there's this famous obelisk kind of uh, to the left of Old Main if you're looking north. And essentially what they've done for that uh, sculpture is they've taken uh, pieces of marble and pieces of limestone from, I think it's every county in Pennsylvania and stack them into this obelisk oh, shape to, to show different parts cool. of the state. So with this shot, I was really fortunate to get that engraving on the right there and then an, a little bit of a sharper image of the moon on the left, right during totality. You can see some of the seas there and we're so starting to come This out is a real bit. shot. This is not like a montage or something, right? Yeah, that's a single shot. Yes, this is a real shot. Single are, shot. This is all the same. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, I, I'd like to point out that you caught Uranus in that shot. Uh, Did I? There's a star above the moon, not there. Go up to the first star, but that's Uranus. Wow. You got it. Wow. There you go. Good I shot. didn't even notice that. That might be yep. a first. You have, yep, you have Uranus. Uranus popped out be because of that darkness of that moon. Uranus popped out pretty easily in, you know, in shots. Um, but yeah, you got it. That's Uranus. Um if you were to zoom in, you might even see it has a little bit of a greenish blue hue on it. Right. So that's that you got that's more a, than you bargained for in that shot. That's another shot for the university to put in their guide to yeah, why you wow. want to go to the school. <laughs> yep. That's that's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't cool. notice I caught that before. Um, yeah, the, the moon was setting here. I think it would have been seven or eight degrees at that point. It was behind a lot of the buildings and this was the only clear shot i got and the opportunity presented itself um but this is this is a single shot um i took that and i i went into photoshop i adjusted some of the brightness and some of the contrast a little bit uh, mm -hmm. some of the colors um but it's pretty authentic to to what the raw image was there's no moving parts around or anything like right. that and, and yeah, then there's uranus well in there so how about that quite lucky to have caught that. I didn't know that. Thank you, Adrian. Oh, and this was a nice shot uh, kind of towards the end. As the moon was starting to set and the sun was coming up, um, you know, people had classes, people had things they wanted to do that day. So we thought, let's go for a sunrise hike. We've already been up and, you know, we'll make the most of the morning we have now, now that the moon's already set. So this is a shot overlooking State College. This is looking almost due east. So you have the sun rising a little bit farther south of that. And then at that time, if you could look through the trees, and I couldn't really get a shot of this, you could see the moon just on the horizon. And it was kind of a pink color because it was still coming out of totality, but it was changed in color a little bit by the sunrise. And it's one of those things that I think, even if I got a picture of, I couldn't have done justice because that was a really beautiful thing with the moon exactly opposite the sun in the sky and them setting and rising at opposite times, if you can visualize that. Uh, it's one of those things that really makes you feel like you're in a very active universe with a, a very alive night sky, if that makes sense. Right. Because oftentimes we think of it as static, but we're in a very dynamic solar system. And seeing all of that happening at once uh, was a very cool and unforgettable experience. And finally, to close out the slideshow, uh, we have a picture here of the sunrise. So, of course, the moon's yeah. just about set by that point, and we're overlooking an ice forest. And we got to have some coffee and a sunrise and some great pictures and memories from an eclipse. And the reason I, I tell this story today is because I do like planning outreach events quite a lot. I've done them with the library. I've done them with uh, both my high school and my college. But having something a little spontaneous like this where everyone gets together and enjoys an event in the night sky is a very special memory uh, to me. And I'm sure many other people have memories like it. So there's always an opportunity to do outreach. There's always an opportunity to share some aspect of the night sky with other people because it's always up there and many of us enjoy it. It's a very captivating thing for everyone, I think. So if you ever have something coming up like this, maybe it's that lunar eclipse in October of 2025, I think. If it's the solar eclipses we have coming up, if it's the comet and meteor shower or something like that, definitely take advantage of that wherever possible because you'll definitely find an audience who's fascinated to learn more about it.
So thank you very much for having right. me today, Scott. Right. Thank Always you, happy Eric. to share these stories with people. Thanks, Connell. Okay, that's wonderful. No, uh, that's great. And what, what do you think that will be your next uh, astronomy adventure, Connell? Um, it's a little hard to tell. Um, I found that from school, it's a little bit harder to observe. It's hard to find a good location and sure. you know, without light pollution and things like that. Uh, we were talking about Neef earlier, and of course, I live a lot closer to that than, than Alcon was uh, back in summer. So I'll do my best to make it up to that. So okay. hopefully I'll see some of you around. Yeah, please um, come to not, our booth. We'll be there. I'd love to. Um, maybe during the summer, I'll get some observing in. We'll see what happens. But I'd sure love to come back on and share something else interesting, whatever comes my way. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again, Connor. Thank you again. All right, so we're going to go down to Brazil uh, to uh, Marcelo Souza, who runs an amazing outreach program, uh, primarily centered on youth. Uh, uh, you know, he I have been to uh, one of his events down south. I've done some of this also virtually, but he gets an incredible crowd, super enthusiastic um, uh, crowd, interested in space. Uh, space exploration, astronomy. Uh, his teams have built uh, CubeSats. They've done all kinds of stuff. They've also helped establish uh, Brazil's first, and I think the Southern, uh, Southern South America's first dark sky park, okay, um, uh, down in Brazil. So, uh, Marcello, thank you for coming on uh, to Global Star Party and, uh, and for presenting with us again. Thank you, Scott. It's a great pleasure to be here to participate. And for us, a long time for me, but for our group, uh, the spirit in the beginning of the year is to have holidays here in Brazil. Uh, from the end of December until the beginning of February, we have holidays. Holidays and the, we also have in February the Carnival. That's a big celebration. Then uh, we generally say here that the, the year only begins here in Brazil after Carnival. And uh, we have here uh, something that everybody knows about the sky. Now they, they probably don't know the name of the constellations, but they find these three stars in the sky because during the summer, uh, they have the opportunity to see Orion uh, up to their heads and in the beginning of the night. And the, you have the, these three stars that uh, correspond to the belt of the Orion. Mm -hmm. It's very famous here in Brazil. They call the Three Marys, Three Sisters Mary. And it's very famous here. Everybody knows about this. When you organize it in the spirit or any period of the year, and they ask if they know a constellation, the name of a constellation, everybody say the three Marys. They imagine also that it is a constellation. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's so famous here because it, uh, the summer cool. is the year that people have the opportunity to look to the sky. Uh, not this year because it's raining a lot here in Brazil. Mm. And, uh, almost every day you have clouds here in where I live in Rio de Janeiro, the state of Rio de Janeiro, and in many parts of Brazil, but it's very famous. And uh, we use these three stars, and three men, as a reference to help them to recognize the constellation, and to Orion, and to have alignment with uh, Aldebaran, Pontaurus, and the Sirius from the Canis Major, and it also is opportunity to show them also the place when it's possible to see. Now they, it's uh, we are planning to begin next week uh, summer school here about the sun and the astronaut. And uh, even with all the problems that everybody knows that's happening in Brazil, but we are going ahead. Right? Then we are planning for next week the uh, summer school, and we are going to talk about the uh, constellation, how to find this. And uh, I have here uh, a small history about the Brazilian Indians, and uh, a tribe that's called Kayapós. You have 
many tribes here in Brazil, right, in the past. And the, yet today you have tribes in Amazon and in parts of Brazil. And you have a famous history about how the life began on Earth and mm. in their vision. And it's important because they also have an idea about the stars that they see at night. Right? It's associated with their past. I would like to, to tell the history here. Uh, many years, I have here a script, a short script. I follow the script. Many years ago, the Kayapo Indians uh, uh, lived on clouds, on clouds. Uh, and there, they don't have uh, rivers, forests. And one day, a hole appeared in the clouds. And uh, from that place, they heard different noise from those they knew in their daily lives. Despite the great fear, they gradually approached the hole. Out of curiosity, one of the Indians bent down to look through the hole. He saw a green region, that is the Amazon. Mm. He reported this, this observation to the other members of the tribe, who went to check his account, also observing through the hole. Several meetings were held between the wise men of the tribe in an attempt to understand what they observed. They decided that it would be necessary to explore the new region. There were several volunteers. As time passed, the momentum of the volunteers waned. Only two men and two women, women two couples, né, maintaining the initial, initial spirit. Thus, was marked the day of the beginning of the exploration. The brave explorer said goodbye to their families and friends, and they mm -hmm. didn't know that they might find. A grand ceremony was held. They received the audio auxiliary equipment, ball, air, or supplies. A large hope ladder had been produced from the clouds until the, the Amazon. Né? They threw the ladder through the hole. Down it, two brave couples descended. They had undertaken to return within a certain period of time to bring news. When they reached the ground, they were amazed at what they saw. Beautiful and leaf trees, birds, a big river, animals they didn't know. They began to follow a tattoo. They followed a butterfly. They walked along the river. They were impressed by the beauty of the place. Time passed and they forgot to return to the clouds where they live. That's hilarious. To the clouds, they were start to get worried. They had made an emergency plan, afraid that ladder would be used by evil spirits. After the deadline, they would cut the rope ladder. Explorers lost the track of time with so much new stuff they were discovering. Time ran out. And in the clouds, the tribe decided to cut the land. Despite the protest of relatives and friends of brave adventurers, the ladder was cut. Night began to arrive in the Amazon when the beginning of the darkness of the environment, the brave explorers remembered their commitment. They ran toward the place where the ladder was. When they got there, the ladder was lying on the ground. They could not return to the clouds. They started to cry. The night has come. At one point, one of them looked up to the sky. He stopped the crying. He got the attention of the others, who also looked at the sky and stopped the crying. What did they see? They saw the starry sky, starry night and with beautiful stars. They imagined each of the stars as a representation of the bonfires that are lit in the clouds, where they live. So every time they looked at the sky, they would be remembered their family and friends who had stayed in the clouds. These two couples gave rise to life on Earth. And the Kayapo Indians, Brazilian, man, 
see signs of their ancestors every time they look at the beautiful starry sky. This is a very, uh, not many people here in Brazil knows about this. Yeah, uh, I just certainly story. didn't know about this story. This is very cool. This is a very uh, uh, beautiful history. Yes. And uh, every time they look at the stars at night, they imagine the people that live, and they imagine they continue to live uh, on the clouds, mm -hmm. and they put fire at night, and the fire that they put uh, are the stars that they see. That's something that uh, I think that is fantastic. And uh, for this moment, uh, it's important that know the importance of science. And I, I wait that uh, even with all the problems, we are going to solve everything and uh, we continue to develop science, to produce new models, equipment, that uh, this that allow us to be here, you know, uh, this system that we are using. And we uh, have a famous writer, that is Eduardo Galeano, that some uh, he wrote many books. In one of the books, he have, has a report right, about what they saw in a mm. wall in Colombia, and uh, it was written, uh, let's leave the pessimism for better times. This is what we are trying to do now. Thank you, Scott. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much yeah. And by the way, um, uh, you know, uh, Marcello Souza is the editor of Skies Up magazine. We'll have a new issue coming out here pretty soon. And uh, really appreciate you for all that you do, Marcello. Thank you for, you know, being that, that defender of science and astronomy uh, in your country and, and an inspiration to people all over the world. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for our kind words. It's a great pleasure to be here. Great. That's wonderful. Okay, so our next speaker, uh, you know, we have, w w one of the things you learn about Global Star Party is that there are, are all these kind of different traditions and stuff, but we all love the sky, and we all feel that that unites us, uh, and, um, you know, what better way to celebrate that than, you know, during, uh, you know, here in the Northern Hemisphere when you might be freezing your, your toes off, uh, then to go down to the Florida Keys to the Winter Star Party. And Russ Brick is one of the leaders of uh, the Winter Star Party. It's put together by a, uh, a great group of people. Uh, uh, Southern Cross Astronomical Society uh, is, is at the helm there. But uh, it wouldn't happen without all those people that do this. And uh, we've been uh, fortunate enough to participate in many of these uh, winter star parties and uh, we will be down there as well but um, I'm going to turn this over to Russ Brick. Russ thanks for coming on to Global Star Party. Thanks Scott, thanks for having me. How are you guys doing tonight? Adrian, how are you? Doing good, looking at your beautiful weather behind you and oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> once again I'm reminded it's always daytime in the morning. I know where I can go. Well, it kind of looks like an arpeggio down there. It's not, that's not really our keys. No, uh, okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, but um, it, I'm sure the weather is sort of similar. I mean, warmer. That's that's what nice. I took away. It was 81 today. Uh, wow. Yeah. And I think it was 31 today here. So, yeah, you got <laughs> us by a about 50 in degrees. A lot of places. Yeah. Um, yep. So, and cloudy. We're moving along. We're about 30 days out now. Uh, mm -hmm. everything's coming together. The site is going to have some challenges this year at the Girl Scout camp, but nothing we can't handle. Uh, I've got about 250 people so far. Okay. And we probably are on pace to end up with about 300. And that's probably 240, you know, paid uh, attendees. Sure. The rest would be staff, speakers, um, vendors, manufacturers. Um, so yeah, we're expecting good weather. Um, yeah. We've already made our payment to uh, certain astronomy gods. 
<laughs> sacrifice a lamb here or there. Right. So, right. Let's, let's talk go. a little uh, bit. Let's talk a little bit about how uh, Winter Star Party got started. I know you know the history well, but let's go a little bit further back to some of the history of the Southern Cross Astronomical Society and how that got started. I mean, Southern SCAS is an old astronomy club. Old, 1922. Right. Um, I apologize. I should be more versed in all of that. Um, our founders, they started with just a simple telescope. Mm -hmm. And the times they at a park in Miami. Right. Um, it blossomed into a couple of other locations. And in the 20s, you know, the late 20s, there were several parks in Miami that had telescopes, but mainly Southern Cross was, you know, handling all the bulk of it. Right. right. And back then, they were like a true society. Um, now I'm not quite sure what that mean that word means because in all reality I view us as an astronomy club. Um, but back then it had the Southern Cross Astronomical Society. It had a lot of clout in this area. I see. I see. And the club's founders, um, Tippy Dioria, these had a lot of clout in the astronomy community in the later years. Uh, the winner, the That's founder sure. of the Winter Star Party, which started in, uh, this would be the 39th consecutive year, but we got inter, you know, we got interrupted by COVID. While we say it's our 39th year, it's really actually only the 37th Star Party. I see. And they first started at uh, at Mahogany Hammock, and they actually had to break their stuff down every day because they couldn't stay in the park. Oh, wow. That would have yeah. been a major inconvenience. Yeah. I mean, people was, set up, they pull her a line, they, you know, the. It was kind of weird. Good. Yeah. So they lasted there for three years. And then they actually went to Camp Sawyer, I believe, for two years and then okay. moved into Camp Wasumke. So Sawyer's um, right next door, right? Right next door. That's okay. That's the Boy Scout camp. And okay. right now we use Camp Jackson Sawyer as our um, sister facility in the mm -hmm. Star Party. We have all our RVs and our motorhomes and little pop-ups and everything over on the Girl Scout camp. Okay. And there's only tent camping and these, what the Boy Scouts call glam tents on their side. Okay. They also have all the facilities. And if you're coming to the Winter Star Party and you're staying on Camp Sawyer, you'll have access to electric as well. So you like got we showers, girls. Yeah. flush toilets. You yes. got 10 everything. showers and 10 toilets. Yeah. Excellent. Um, over on the Girl Scout camp, of course, it's rustic camping. The only thing will be there would be porta potties. Right. Unless you have your own RV. Unless, of course, you have your own RV. Right. Yeah. Or your camp next to a guy who has an RV. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You can get and friends. You make friends you know? with him real quick. That's right. That's right. Well, it's easy to make friends at Winter Star Party in, in general, I would say. And it is at, at most star parties, but something special. There's something special about the Winter Star Party. You know, you get there there's there's a saying. I don't know if you would agree with this or not, but there's some Something about this, what they call a keezy feeling, okay? But yeah, you kind of, you get down there, you slow down, you know, and you, you start to decompress as without you're out on doubt. that strip of land. And, uh, and then to watch the stars come up from, you know, you're seeing Southern Hemisphere objects there. The Southern Cross Astronomical Society is called that because they can because see the Southern, the Southern Cross, Cross, okay? Exactly. Right? And so yes, it is, that's exactly right. it's, a, it's a beautiful experience. Um, the skies there are dark, okay? Uh, yeah, you can see a dome of Marathon or these kinds of things. And you can kind of see actually sort of a dome even going all the way down, I think sometimes down to Cuba, okay? Because you're not far away. But, but uh, uh, you know, I have seen some amazing deep sky objects from 
uh, from the Winter Star Party, and uh, it is um, it is uh, not only spectacular from its site, not only spectacular from what you can see, but the people that run it, you included, Russ, uh, are just amazing, and you make it a very memorable uh, experience that you want to go back and do again and again. Well, that's what we host the star party for. We want to make our attendees welcome and we want to do our best to make sure that everybody has a good time. And as long as the weather cooperates, you will have a good time. <laughs> yes, you will. <laughs> and even if it doesn't cooperate, you're still going to have a good time. It's still going to well, be warmer. <laughs> if you think about it, for the price of the ticket, and the camping fee and whatever else you have to spend yeah it's no greater than one or two nights and you can stay down there for seven nights that's right yeah that's right and, well, and actually six. to clarify that it's it is expensive to stay in the florida keys if you're just going to go down and rent a hotel room uh there are no hotel rooms that are much less than a couple of hundred bucks a night okay uh, yeah, there are no hotel rooms that are under like four or five hundred dollars. That's that's also true. Yeah, but it's, I'm talking about motel rooms. You know, it's so. crazy. I, <laughs> it is crazy I mean, expensive. But to stay there say, on the site, watch the sunrise, watch it set. You know, it is beautiful. And the gentle breaking of the tiny little waves lapping on the shore. Right. It's, it's really not waves awesome. like what's behind you here. It's, it's, and what uh, nobody really knows is over on Camp Sawyer, yeah. there's a dock that extends out into a deep water pool. And huh. you, can, you can dive and swim out there. What? Yep. I didn't know this. <laughs> I didn't either, but I do now. You do now. So there's actually great things to do during the day. Oh, the, yeah, there's plenty to do. Uh, um, you know, you can go into Key West, you can go into Marathon. There are some amazing restaurants. Oh, oh my God. Yes. Keys Fisheries. If, yes. You know, if I had to give a shameless plug to any place, it would be them. The lobster mac and cheese is just off the hook. No, I. One of the most amazing dishes. More reasons. I've ever no did pun intended. In oh, yeah, my no God. Pun. Nope. Oh yeah, I yeah, and of course sure. you got the famous key lime pie, uh, but not only not only the restaurants, it's the entertainment that's down there, uh, the shopping uh, that can all West is also a down there. Right, that's right. Gallery Square at sunset with all of the street acts. Yep, yeah. it's and fun. Then, of course, your best chance to see the green flash. Uh, yes. Yeah. That's right. well, and to stand at the southernmost point in the United States. In the United you know? States. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's that, right. The uh, Southern Cross alone, that may that may make it easier for me to uh, get that taken care of. I'd still have to travel further south for the Magellanic Clouds and you know so forty seven Tucane. I'm not sure if that shows up, um, but Southern Cross, I'm I'm all for that. You know, that that would be another section of the Milky Way that would go into a presentation where I, right now I only have four sections. Two of them are missing. The part with the Southern Cross and the part with the Magellanic Clouds. Oh, wow. So yeah. I'd get one section. I'd be able to take care of one section going down there. And then the other one, um, Argentina, I'll probably have to go well, further. But it sounds it sounds amazing. I, I put the in my it schedule is. and, and it's very affordable that, adrian it. it is very affordable you get yourself down there uh fly you know fly into miami that's usually from almost anywhere in the united states an inexpensive trip yeah. i don't know why but it is and then uh rent a car you're going to love the drive down there as you go over those what is it that seven mile bridge or whatever it is i mean it's just yeah. the seven mile bridge yeah that's yeah. exactly right it's spectacular you're out in the middle of the key you're out in the middle of the keys water yeah, yeah. Mm. You can go to the No Name Pub. Uh, you can. Uh, there's so many cool things to do down there. And if you love snorkeling and diving, you know, go go to Sombrero uh, Reef I've done out that there. That's a great place to start. I've done oh, that Adrian, once or twice. One of the best things is when yeah. you wake up at three o'clock in the morning and yeah. you walk outside your tent 
and Omega Centauri is looking at you like a searchlight. That's right. That's <laughs> and the sky well, the sky can be so steady. Cross. It can be so steady out there. You'll see people pushing their telescopes upwards of a hundred power per inch. Okay, mm -hmm. which is almost unheard of almost right. anywhere else. Yeah. You know, because yeah, that laminar the... airflow that comes in. So you're gonna see detail on planets that's gonna blow your mind. Yeah, I saw the SQM meter. Twenty one point seventy six is no slouch. That's that's uh if that's it's your dark. average now is that that's the average pointing it up in the sky or an average that you took over like the horizon and the sky oh when i shoot mine i shoot mine right in the middle of the property so it's at the sky yeah so that's that, at the horizon yeah that for my for my shots i'll do horizon just to well, it's explain even the darker glow. in the south yeah and then it's uh yep and then going up to the sky yeah 21.76 is top portal three and since getting a uh, sqm meter i've pretty much learned that you know here in michigan we kind of overestimate what a portal three sky is it's really portal four but it uh -huh. still looks dark to us sure. um so portal three is gonna be fan just as fantastic well i can um, see stars down to a degree on the horizon that's right. That's, that's absolutely true. fantastic. It's pretty clear. That's true. That's, that's clear. And and I, a, a funny story at one winter star party I was at because you can see stars right down to the horizon there. Okay, was uh, we had a guy set up. It was his first time to use an auto guider on his telescope, and he wanted to photograph part of what what he could see right along the horizon there. He wanted to get down as far south as he could, and. Mm -hmm. He noticed that his telescope kept moving, kept moving, kept moving, kept moving. And there was a sailboat out there with a light on it. And he was auto guiding on, on, on a light out there. And the reason why he was is because there was stars around the sailboat at the horizon. So, you know, he got fooled by thinking it was so just another picked star. Up, yeah, he picked up sailboat star and boy, <laughs> his guiding was off. On that wow. yeah. So if you want an experience, uh, Adrian, even if you went to the Southern Hemisphere and you got to ex see all of that, and it is amazing, you would still be, a, be in awe of what you would experience at Winter Star Party. So no, it's I believe a bucket it. list thing. Yeah, I believe it. I, um, I would just have to get down there, make sure that I could afford the amenities because I'd want to go to some of these places. I have been known to sort of rough it, grab the uh, grab the snacks. And it's just warm enough to look camp. At the sky, sleep it's warm all enough day. to camp, and you'll save big bucks by doing that. And yeah, yeah, winter star yeah, party would, makes it super affordable. This yeah, is my favorite star party food is Chef Boyardee spaghetti in a can. So <laughs> <laughs> that that works for me. I'm I'm there for the night. I'm not there for you know if I want. <laughs> gourmet i can do that anytime in michigan oh I yeah for you, all you gotta do is just drive off that's yep. right no that well, make sure great. that you make it down there explore scientific is going to be giving a door prize uh so you might be the lucky winner of a door prize down there there'll be other people other companies i'm sure giving door prizes down there as well and um and you're going to make some new friends you can't go to winter star party and not make new friends you know that's just impossible so and uh, I guarantee you that once you experience it once, you can't wait to get back again. Yeah, and that's there'll be a couple of 30-inch scopes down there. And when oh, you look so. at the planets through a 30-inch telescope, oh, it's kind of like mind-blowing. Yeah. No, oh, my God. Yes, <laughs> no, I, you're right. Yeah, and you need imagine. that seeing quality to actually look at a planet with a big scope like that. So, you know, and they have it. So, yeah. Russ, thanks for thanks for coming on. Yeah. And, uh, sharing with us. I have posted uh, in the chats for everybody where they can go and sign up for Winter Star Party. If you haven't gone, you guys are thinking, oh, you yeah. know, it might be a little far away or whatever. Forget that. Go, just do it, okay? You're, February you're, 13th you're, you've been cooped 19. up long enough, okay? <laughs> you've been yes, cooped up come long down enough. to the sunny Florida. Come down That's to the right. Keys. Relax. That's right. And have some fun. That's right. Eat some conch. <laughs> Eat some clock, exactly. Some clock. <laughs> Russ, oh. thank you so much. Thanks for hey, coming. Scott, on. Thanks for having me on. Adrian, good seeing you again. Good seeing you again, Russ. All right, and, my friends. Uh, take care. You too. All right. Bye bye.
All right. So we're now at the end of uh, Global Star Party, and our final speaker is Adrian Bradley. Adrian's nightscapes have been amazing. Uh, his sense of of composition, but is is his uh, he's been taken on on this voyage of what he's been learning about the sky. And I'll say from the from the first Global Star Party to where he is now, his knowledge of the sky has increased a lot. Okay, because he's really dug into his images of the Milky Way. Um, uh, he makes beauty in, in the images that, that uh, he presents to us, but uh, uh, at the same time, we're, we're going on this voyage with him as he's learning more about our galaxy. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Adrian. Thanks, man. All right, thank you. And uh, happy 110th, if I got the number right. That's Little right. Star party. We just learned. Yep, we uh, learned about the uh, star party in the Keys. It's something that I'm going to have to talk about the finances with because now I want to go. But um, especially based on how um, our skies have been in Michigan, I'm going to share my screen and get right into the presentation is... Uh, I should probably drink this. I'm going to drink this water in front of everybody and share my screen. Now, Scott told you chasing dark skies, and that's the theme that I'm using. But to talk about my chase in December, I had to replace the word with cloudy because uh, we had an unprecedented or maybe it was precedented. Um because here in Michigan, a lot of the astronomers talk about the clouds, but literally we had maybe two days and the picture I'm showing you is one of the two days where stars were visible. Now, lately, we've had a couple of clearings that I've missed just simply because um, I just wanted the time to um, recover because I tried and traveled anyways um in chasing these uh cloudy skies starting with the moon mars occultation it was cloudy but you're seeing the pictures that i took anyways i can't zoom in here but now this is essentially this part of the moon where mars is coming right out from behind the moon everything's a little fuzzy because you can kind of tell in this image there were clouds and the moon the full moon was uh shining just bright enough through the clouds for me to take an exposure oh, wow. look at that and there's that's the red beautiful planet hiding behind there so the clouds didn't stop me from seeing the moon mars occultation i didn't know if i was going to get it i decided to pull when i got home i decided to aim up at the sky and give it a shot and it, it worked out it worked but out very well. yeah so here you're seeing clouds um you know i i practice my landscape imaging all the time my nightscape i call it and so you're seeing a couple of images from a dark sky park where there were clouds but there was going to be a clearing so i went anyway and i took those images and then i went to another favorite spot in the thumb lots and lots of clouds at that site this is a site that i wish to before it's over with the cygnus region is going to set right over here and it's going to make this particular shot it's going to make for a beautiful nightscape with the cygnus region of the milky way setting and you'll see some other examples where i took pictures like that at other sites this site should turn out really nice if only it wouldn't be cloudy I had, took an SQML reading of 20.97. This happened, this 95% cloud coverage swooped in on me um, right as I was setting up. Um, I noticed the sky started mm. to get hazy. I could see the dipper in the distance. Mm. And then I couldn't see the dipper anymore. I couldn't see the North Star anymore. Then I looked, this is to the east because you can barely see the stars of Orion rising over the lighthouse light over here and uh what was going to be 
a shot of Orion rising and the winter Milky Way coming here was a shot of really thick clouds. And uh, they came in really fast. And it's a beautiful composition, though, and to see the tapestry of stars down below in between the horizon and the clouds is still cool. Yeah, this is this area. I think this bright area comes from a location in Canada off to the distance. Um, there is a city there. I, I could figure that out. And that's a plane. I thought it might be a meteor, um, but that is a plane. Um, I've been working again. It was an opportunity to work on compositions because I I want my images to look seamless here. I kind of missed. I'm going to have to work a little tougher um, or work a little harder on my uh, compositions and figure out how to get the two, you know, the sky image and the ground image to meld in a little bit better. So still working on that. Uh, that I also love this my seas are starting to look more and more like just calm seas with a little less of the uh modeling from the the noise reduction and this was an evening shot that i took um i said it, it'll be a really nice uh nightscape this is the osabo river the northern lower peninsula of michigan for those that are familiar with the state of michigan here in the u.s and so I take these shots with the clouds just because I want to know where the site is, if it's a new site like this one, and I want to get an idea, can I get a good part of the sky? You know, we're facing northwest here, and um, so the Cygnus region will fall. Um, the Orion region is going to rise. I'm going to find out which one will I be able to see in that window um, you know, when the when it's finally stops being cloudy. So this was um, this was interesting. I was back at a this is a restaurant site um, where things were looking promising. I actually saw this region of the Milky Way. This was uh, it was. I would say nautical twilight. And so I thought, well, you know what? I'll go behind here. There's a trail. I'll go back out to the uh, where that river is, and I'll get a really good shot. 20 minutes later. Oh. <laughs> and that's what, that's what happened. I got there, and <clears throat> all like I had a book was this, Yeah, I, all I had was this motivational picture. So that's, uh, this was, this has been our life. So what do we do? Well, there was one clear night in Alcona County. And uh, this was a picture that David Iker was kind enough to share on his social media feed. Hmm. Not this picture. This was before the picture. This is the image. And there's the Alsabo um, River again. It's why I love being on that river. Yeah. Because it's that. a beautiful image. This Very was essentially me celebrating the fact that i had a clear night and it was on the winter solstice um december 21st which also happened to be my mother's birthday so i mm. sent her this picture um <clears throat> and a happy birthday you can see some of the winter milky way rising here um i think this star's name is sife and um there's rigel and there's the the Orion complex you can barely see. I use modified cameras for my images, of course, and just correct the uh, white balance. And so this, I took this shot. I thought about coming over here where this part of the bridge is and taking another shot. You know, the Osabo River is uh, flowing, even though it was wintry, but it's not the first time I've taken pictures on this bridge. So this was the year before. And when life throws you clouds, go back and reprocess old images. And that's what I ended up doing is just taking more ideas and things that I was learning and going back and reprocessing the images. Here's the Cygnus region um, of the Milky Way setting to the Northwest. 
And that's the region that I want to try and capture in some of those other, the other um, sites where I'm facing Northwest. I want to see this region. Now, most Milky Way shooters that you talk to may say that Milky Way season is a certain time in the north. Well, for me, Milky Way season is year round. I'm going to face the camera and tell them Milky Way season is actually year round. You go to a dark enough spot like this and you'll see the Milky Way. It'll be fainter. It'll take a little more exposure and a little more careful processing to bring out other regions of the Milky Way that are faint in at our latitude north. And most and it's cold. Most people will say, I'll wait till the summer and I'll just image, you know, the, the region around the core. I try to image all of it, especially the Orion region. And you'll see some of these re reprocessed images. I had a golden opportunity to have this Aurora show up at one of the sites in the Milky Way streaming from it. That's the North American Nebula here. I've got a couple of other images. Nice. This one, yeah, this one made the Aurora stand out a little more. Um, the Milky Way, I may have diffused it a little too much, but all of this color is real. That's how bright the Aurora was, and I'm at about 40... 42, 40 second and a half north latitude, um, the lower peninsula of, of Michigan. And we could see all that. This was in 2021. It was, there was a pretty good storm, um, geomagnetic storm on that night. And so here, this was taken with an iPhone. Sometimes you just see something, you take the shot. And if you, you know, if you take it, at the right time with the right light, you know, your DSLR camera doesn't have to be out. Any, any smartphone will do. I came here to take pictures. Yeah. I came here to take pictures. This is next to the Niagara, next to Niagara falls. This is a small falls, but you can hear the roar. It's the largest, it's the largest uh, falls close to us in Michigan. Um, without going over to Canada, I think it's actually a little further, a little further to get to these falls in the Upper Peninsula. Um, it's a beautiful area with hiking trails. This is in the winter. And um, I stayed here to try and take images. Clouds came, of course, at night. So, you know, this dark sky I was hoping to see never did happen. It was, it got too cloudy at night. It's as if all those clouds you see here, they all grabbed their buddies and they came over this region. It was very hard to see around me because the clouds ended up making it super dark. And, um, but it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful region of beautiful falls. This is overlooking the falls. There are a couple of lookouts and then there's on the brink. You can go over here and see us. Those of you that are in Michigan, you may have, you may know of this area, but there are some hidden treasures and this, there's another reason there are hidden treasures to take your images. You can have the night sky and you can have some beautiful places. Um, we love the rock formations of Utah and we love some of the, um, the mountainous regions where Milky Way photos are taken. They are absolutely beautiful. But when you don't live by those areas, you have to make do with what you've got. And um, so you have to look around, look for some beautiful areas to do your photography. And if you're like me and you can you'll do visual astronomy, you'll try and find a good wide open spot where you can set up a telescope as well. So you can take on both aspects of astronomy and not just looking for a place to image. So. This was another one David Eicher shared. It's a Christmas card look. This is the star Vega at the time that I took this image. Wow. Um, I actually believe it was as far from Christmas as you could get. I think it was June. <laughs> and I do believe that was an actual meteor. It looks like it may have been a plane, but there were a lot of meteors. The Perseids were around. Mm -hmm. So uh -huh. one of them was shooting between the trees. Another celestial visitor. That's right. Yeah. 
but it but because we were around pine trees and i took the picture and set the star where i or yeah the composed vega to sit right here so i use this as a christmas card this is the one that uh this is a reprocess of our good friend david david levy saw a version of this picture that i took and said that he loved it he loved the way the trees were basically surrounding and pointing upwards to the night sky i went back to try and image it so that it looked a little more natural and i was able to pull out some color in the trees and the road now you get the stance you get the sense that you're looking up in the middle of the road which is not safe but you're too busy paying attention to what's up here so i don't recommend stopping in a forest like i did and taking these shots i don't i hardly do this much but sometimes you see something and you decide i'm going to try and get that because it looks beautiful to me so that's how that's how some of the shots come about i just notice something and i'll take the photo every once in a while I'd say a couple of years ago, I tried my hand at just using what I had to do some classic astrophotography. When we think astrophotography, you know, taking pictures of deep space objects and, um, you know, getting them, getting those images. And all I wanted here was to be able to say that I imaged the Running Man Nebula along with the Orion Nebula. This is what I would consider if you're moving from beginning to intermediate in your astrophotography. This was a rather dark location. It was high bordel four. I didn't have an SQM meter. Um, based on what I've taken meter readings, the skies were similarly dark that night. And um, with only two frames, you could get this much detail out of the Orion Nebula and the Running Man and Orion Sword. So imagine if I did this the way that most of us do and, um, you know, take 200 of these, you end up with a really, really nice really image nice and a time. lot more. All of this <clears throat> haze right here becomes more gas that, you know, looks more like this. And you end up with a lot of nebulosity in this region. This barely scratches the surface. And you can barely see a couple of different colors, like the oh, the oxygen here, the hydrogen alpha, which kind of dominates. There's M73. And this whole thing is a sharpless object in NGC 1977. It's one of the clusters of stars included here. So that's a very popular way to shoot the Orion Nebula when it's sitting straight up. And if you look for uh, the Astro Backyard, um, first name is Trevor. Trevor Jones mm -hmm. has an image he's proud of of this region. It's this, but with all of that nebulosity and his, you know, his rendering of it basically takes this to a different level. It's this shot exactly, but taken at a way different level. A lot of astro imagers cut their teeth on the Orion Nebula. But me, I went back to shooting these nightscapes. Now, here's here's the Asabo River in the winter. Again, this was actually opposite the first image that I showed. And now reason that people like to shoot the summer milky way is because it's the brightest part now the southern part is just as bright down here through the ground mm -hmm. this is the northern part <clears throat> and this was my first attempt at actually stacking a few frames of this and then processing it and then lining it up based on where i saw the where the milky way was sitting you know, over this river and it didn't work out too bad. There were, I would say somewhere between seven and 10 of those frames, each of them somewhere around a minute. The Milky Way moves quite quickly. 
as the whole sky does, we rotate pretty quickly. You can you can do a two minute, you can do a five minute exposure if you wanted to, if your tracking is that good. But with landscape shooting or nightscapes, getting a hundred of these isn't very practical because you have an entire sky and you have your composition. So most will, if they want to stack, they'll go between like four or seven or maybe even 10. They'll stack shorter frames so that the Milky Way hasn't moved as much. When you put these images together in a layer, it has to make sense. There are imagers that'll just stack the sky, maybe go to a different location and stack the sky and then shoot this location when there's more light and you end up with an image that looks beautiful, but if not done, you know, if not done carefully, you can tell that the images weren't, weren't taken at the same time. And, and that may not rub a lot of imagers, you know, the right way. Um, I tend to prefer capturing what I see because all of the light that's in this image yeah. is the light that was there when I took those <laughs> images. And it it makes it look more I'm not necessarily I'm not necessarily looking for an image that's going to, you know, blow the left side of your mind out, but I do want my images to encourage you to go out there and see just how beautiful the night sky is, right. especially when paired against. I'll take shots in some places like this is standing right in the middle of the bridge. And I think it was four in the morning or something. Um, you may not want to stand in the middle of a bridge you know, middle or the middle of a road, but you'll want to come to this area and see you know, this part of the night sky for yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the goal that I typically have when I, um, you know, when I'm doing my night sky photography. And right. so that is my presentation. And hopefully the image is more so than being, even when it's cloudy, you can still go out and you can take some images. You can go to places that you think will look good at night go there at night and get a feel for the land because some of those, some of the places off of the beaten path are, you want to know where you should go, where you should, you know, how to be safe while you're out there. How close are you to the road? Where can you park? Not all of the places are easily accessible and uh, you want to find that out during the daytime. Then when you go back during night, you know where to go, where to park, Right. And where to park safely, how to operate safely. And there's no shame in a boarding mission if you go out there and you realize that, okay, this just feels too dangerous. I just don't want to do yeah, it. Yeah, of course. Of course. So you, you know, you, you, you balance all of that in. And then you go out there and you take your pictures. And if the, if it's like it was here in Michigan, where almost <clears> the entire <throat> month was, um, you know, was completely cloudy, mm -hmm. you can still do some things and you pay attention to cloud forecasts because the moment that you notice ahead of time that it may clear up, you you think to yourself, okay, this is an opportunity to get out and try and get a shot. And if you just can't, then you're always growing and learning in techniques. And um, so you just try and apply your... Uh, you try and apply techniques that maybe you thought of doing, like I've thought of doing stacking for a while. Um, I'm always working on getting my composite images clean. Um, similar to if you've ever heard of Alan Dyer, he, sure. uh, he got really good at his process to where he puts together his image. Everything was taken at the same time. He believes that you take everything at the same time but you may use a different exposure for each part of your image sure. so that when everything comes together, <clears throat> you know, everything works out really expressing, well. Expressing beauty, there, there are no rules, okay? And, True. Uh, you know, so there are the astrophotographer purists, I'll call them, uh, 
But one of the things I will say, you know, in my, in my experience in photography, as soon as light comes through that lens, okay, uh, th something has changed, okay, and you don't, mm -hmm. you don't have the, you don't have the authentic thing anymore. It's now, it's now changing. Back when it was film, it was striking, uh, you know, black and white films, fit, striking a, a uh, silver halide crystal, okay. Uh, that could only capture a certain range. So now, all of a sudden, even this action, okay, uh, it's not the real thing anymore, you know. But you'll have guys that will argue these points. I think the most important thing is, unless, unless this is a science image, okay, unless this is a science image, that your interpretation of what you're experiencing, how it makes you feel, uh, you know, are all also part you know there's something called the universe and the universe means everything not just some mm. captured compartmentalized uh part of what uh, you think a scientist thinks that the universe might be or whatever but you know it is everything including your 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 interaction with with the universe any artist can tell you this okay um so that's uh I would say that uh, what you're doing, Adrian, is wonderful. I think that you're inspiring people to look up and to explore the universe they live in, and I love it. So, yeah, I, you know, after a while, I think everyone who does this starts to put their own <clears throat> their own um, footprint on sure. images that they take, and you know, you start you look at some images and you go. That looks like an image that was, you know, processed by so and so photographer, astrophotographer. It may be some subtle thing that they like to do. Yeah. And I know with mine, I do try and recreate to some extent an image that reflects this is how beautiful I think this area is. Yeah. And, you know, to be able to, if it's nothing but a cold steel bridge overlooking the river hmm. and if i'm able to make the image it starts with me saying yep that's exactly where i was it did something to me that's what i captured and then if you post it online and you go you know what do you all think and uh different people different people get different things out of images so you you go in there with an open heart and you say this is what you know this is what i took tonight and then you try not to get discouraged if uh, the skies don't cooperate because the universe is under no obligation to help you, especially if you live in Michigan. So you right. just you take it as it comes. And uh, there are times the universe will take care of you plenty. Um, there are locations that you go to where the universe is a little more cordial in that it's just a better climate. But when you can get some beautiful skies where you live, you try and take advantage of it. And I always tell folks, don't forget to look up. The, the stars of these, these DSOs, these objects in space, even the sky itself and the surrounding area, without all of that, you don't have an image. So, you know, it's okay to be proud of the way that you can take an image um you know it, it's okay to be proud if you win an award with your image but you know i just i don't want us to forget that without without the orion nebula you don't have a beautiful orion nebula photo to you know send off to see if you win an award you don't have the horse head um and if you if you can see the horse head directly with your eyes it gives you a different perspective on you know, it's not just something to take a picture of and try and win an APOD with. It's in, you know, I'll mention that Jason Close took a very beautiful picture and won an APOD very recently. So, you know, applause. Those that win APODs, um, definitely, you know, you, you have to keep submitting photos. Um, but we don't want that to be the end all and be all of why you take your photos. You know, we if there's a passion for the night sky, then that's right. That's why, that's why you're out there doing it. 
And when the sky, you know, the sky doesn't show up, you're still taking pictures of clouds because, you know, that that extends into love of nature at that point. So, so again, thank you, Scott, for having me on. Thank um, you. As always. And now I get the I get another week to try and come up with uh, more chasing. Hopefully it's chasing dark skies and not cloudy skies right. yeah. the next time. Nice accolades from uh Paul Burgard, uh, who's watching, um, he was uh, just uh, complimenting you on a great collection of beautiful images. Uh, also, Byron Labadee, who's on with us right now, is, yeah. uh, he said he often takes a single image of the foreground, then uh, he takes a series of nightscape exposures to stack. Then I use Photoshop to add in the foreground, but you do lose the true light and reflections of the images. It all depends. Yeah, and and he also remarks that he's used a drone to scout out nightscape shot areas, which is yeah. And see, Byron, that's a smart way to do it. I have not flown a drone. I've often wondered. Now you may be able to answer that, Byron. Is is it possible to hold a drone absolutely still for thirty seconds and do an exposure? Um, there, the two thousand to three thousand dollar range drones. Uh, a lot of them have Hasselblad cameras, and it depends on the weather. You got a calm night, and you don't go too high. Uh, you can capture uh, some good star images. I'd say up to ten seconds. Okay, so you can you can just get it started. If you're somewhere really dark, you can still sounds like you can still end up with something to work with yeah uh they're not they're not designed to do astrophotography though but yeah that's what uh, i i wondered because that wouldn't you know the the next great shot for astrophotography is a drone that can sit still enough to go at least 30 seconds that's that's long enough to start getting some of that detail that you see in some of those milky way shots if you you imagine the type of you've got the sky and then you've got you know the ground below it so that's uh it's something you can get from a mountaintop but uh i imagine at some point and i don't it physics might prevent this from ha- being able to really do it like that where you just take the uh you take a shot like that with a drone no but, you uh you uh here's to you scott you um invent a gimbal for the camera to stabilize it right and uh you uh equip it with a lens that's ha sensitive you get on that scott and you'll be you'll really be raking in the bucks i i think the military probably already has these kinds of drones (laughs) right so yeah uh, what they spend on them i don't know but uh i imagine they're a pretty penny so Yeah, well, it'll just be a matter of time. Some, I'm sure there's technology we're using that you know military comes down from military. The the night vision goggles that I've heard about, I've used a crude form of one um, in soupy, cloudy weather, and all of a sudden all the stars pop out. I've heard of these things that you 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 basically an image in a binocular it's a, instead of taking an image of it just put these things up to your eyes and look and all of this stuff just appears um you know you see the horse you see things live as if you're looking at a picture before you but you're not you're you're this is a live image so i've heard those things are pretty expensive but i hear stories of those uh you know special military grade night vision or you know oh, something yeah. all right that they've got that some astronomers have gotten a hold of so they are they are expensive and they they emit a green cast and they use photo multipliers that really amplify the darkness so through those uh, the night sky lights up as well as everything else yeah yeah somebody brought a unit to one of our um astronomy at the beach which i'm gonna have to start uh i'll start advertising but it's a you know there are some major star parties with some dark skies 
astronomy at the beach isn't quite one of them, but it's a big gathering for Southeast Michigan. Hmm. Um, and people come through. We mainly look at the planets and bright objects, but it's still it's still an introduction to astronomy for those in Southeast Michigan that may not want to travel. They may not want to travel two or three hours north to another star party right around where I take my images at the uh, Great Lakes Stargaze, where the, you know, the skies start to get dark there. Um, so there, there are a couple of star parties that happen around September. So quite a ways away. Um, we've got uh, the, the winter star party, which I have to cobble together some money and go figure that out. And um, the images at uh, Okie Text always show me you see sky color differences when you take the images there and you try and preserve sky color. Everything's grayer. The the skies are gray and it doesn't take as long an exposure to get absolute detail in any part of the Milky Way that you can see there. And um, then you come back home and you make do with what you've got. But uh, Chile, Byron, I imagine another good spot for Did you take any? night sky photos while you were there um two reasons i didn't one they ran me ragged and two when we went the phasing of the moon wasn't conducive to setting up my portable sky tracker uh moonrise was about 45 minutes after sunset oh, uh yeah. and uh i just wasn't gonna go to the trouble i was just gonna soak in the view and look at the shadow of the milky way on the ground you can see it yeah visually on the ground anyways i uh really admire your imaging your drive is to 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 go these places is over the top your passion is there and uh your desire to share is extreme and you have it all and i'm i truly am in awe of you man well, I appreciate that, Byron. It's uh, my car is in the shop <clears throat> with brakes being fixed right now because of that passion. So, you know, <laughs> it's it, it, it's unfortunate, but navigating yeah. Michigan, navigating Michigan skies, sometimes the hole opens up in yeah. a certain part, and that's where I want to go. And it, it the passion may not be for everybody, but you know, whenever I do get some nice images. I I try and share them. It's uh, if this is if this is a sort of gift, it's it's a gift for everybody that I can share with. So, and gorgeous uh, images, Absolutely thank you, gorgeous, thank you, and just and Randy, the thing is, I have not forgotten the night sky is a star. I will still do visual. Um, I recommend any astrophotographer do some visual astronomy. See it with your eyes. You know, it may not, you may not see all of the outgassing that you'll produce with your images, but have some of those photons hit you directly and see how that feels. When then, when you go and capture it, it's like capturing an old friend. It's not like capturing a, a distant object that, you know, I hope somebody buys it so that they can hang it on the wall. Put it in your heart first, then go, you go after it. And um, it makes a difference. And, it makes a difference when you're out there capturing it. It's like see, seeing Orion rise. It's like seeing an old friend. Absolutely. Then, so, so with that, I, yeah, I want to thank all of you guys uh, uh, for you know participating on the 110th Global Star Party, and uh, I want to thank the audience who uh, tuned in and chatted with us. And uh, uh, we'll be back next Tuesday with the 111th Global Star Party. So. Uh, thanks again for participating and any of you out there that want to uh, approach us and uh, give, give a presentation of your own to express your passion for astronomy, um, you know, it's important because uh, it is the gateway towards scientific literacy and uh, the world needs it now more than ever. So uh, thanks again and uh, we'll see you uh, next time and uh, as my Good friend Jack Horkheimer used to say, uh, keep looking up. Night, everybody. Good night. night.
Thank you.